the sinking of the titanic and other great sea disasters edited by logan marshall this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org today's reading by allison hester of athens georgia introduction dedication and chapter one of sinking of the titanic and other great sea disasters edited by logan marshall dedication to the one thousand six hundred thirty five souls who were lost with the ill-fated titanic and especially to those heroic men who instead of trying to save themselves stood aside that women and children might have their chance of each of them let it be written as it was written of a greater one he died that others might live introduction dr van dyke's spiritual consolation to the survivors of the titanic the titanic greatest of ships has gone to her ocean grave what has she left behind her think clearly she has left debts vast sums of money have been lost some of them are covered by insurance which will be paid the rest is gone all wealth is insecure she has left lessons the risk of running the northern course when it is menaced by icebergs is revealed the cruelty of sending a ship to sea without enough lifeboats and life rafts to hold her company is exhibited and underlined in black she has left sorrows hundreds of human hearts and homes are in mourning for the loss of dear companions and friends the universal sympathy which is written in every face and heard in every voice proves that man is more than beasts that perish it is an evidence of the divine in humanity why should we care there is no reason in the world unless there is something in us that is different from lime and carbon and phosphorus something that makes us mortals able to suffer together for we have all of us a human heart but there is more than this harvest of debts and lessons and sorrows in the tragedy of the sinking of the titanic there is a great ideal it is clearly outlined and set before the mind and heart of the modern world to approve and follow or to despise and reject it is women and children first whatever happened on that dreadful april night among the arctic ice certainly that was the order given by the brave and steadfast captain certainly that was the law obeyed by the men on the doomed ship but why there is no statute or enactment of any nation to enforce such an order there is no trace of such a rule to be found in the history of ancient civilizations there is no authority for it among the heathen races today on a chinese ship if we may believe the report of an official representative the rule would have been men first children next and women last there is certainly no argument against this barbaric rule on physical or material grounds on the average a man is stronger than a woman he is worth more than a woman he has a longer prospect of life than a woman there is no reason in all the range of physical and economic science no reason in all the philosophy of the superman why he should give his place in the lifeboat to a woman where then does this rule which prevailed in the sinking titanic come from it comes from god through the faith of jesus of nazareth it is the ideal of self-sacrifice it is the rule that the strong ought to bear the infirmities of those that are weak it is the divine revelation which is summed up in words greater love hath no man than this that a man lay down his life for his friends it needs a tragic catastrophe like the wreck of the titanic to bring out the absolute contradiction between this ideal and all the counsels of materialism and selfish expediency i do not say that the germ of this ideal may not be found in other religions i do not say that they are against it i do not ask any man to accept my theology which grows shorter and simpler as i grow older unless his heart leads him to it but this i say the ideal that the strength of the strong is given them to protect and save the weak the ideal which animates the rule of women and children first is in essential harmony with the spirit of christ if what he said about our father in heaven is true this ideal is supremely reasonable 
Otherwise, it is hard to find arguments for it. The tragedy of facts sets the question clearly before us. Think about it. Is this ideal to survive and prevail in our civilization or not? Without it, no doubt, we may have riches and power and dominion, but what a world to live in. Only through the belief that the strong are bound to protect and save the weak because God wills it so, can we hope to keep self-sacrifice and love and heroism and all the things that make us glad to live and not afraid to die. Henry Van Dyke, Princeton, New Jersey, April 18, 1912. Facts about the wreck of the Titanic. Number of persons aboard. 2,340. Number of lifeboats and rafts. 20. Capacity of each lifeboat. 50 passengers and a crew of 8. Utmost capacity of lifeboats and rafts. About 1,100. Number of lifeboats wrecked and launching. 4. Capacity of lifeboats safely launched. 928. Total number of persons taken in lifeboats, 711. Number who died in lifeboats, 6. Total number saved, 705. Total number of Titanic's company lost, 1,635. The cause of the disaster was a collision with an iceberg in latitude 41 degrees 46 north, longitude 50 degrees point 41 west. The Titanic had repeated warnings of the presence of ice in that part of the course. Two official warnings had been received defining the position of the ice fields. It had been calculated on the Titanic that she would reach the ice fields about 11 o'clock Sunday night. The collision occurred at 11.40. At that time, the ship was driving at a speed of 21 to 23 knots, or about 26 miles an hour. There had been no details of seamen assigned to each boat. Some of the boats left the ship without seamen enough to man the oars. Some of the boats were not more than half full of passengers. The boats had no provisions. Some of them had no water stored. Some were without sail equipment or compasses. In some boats, which carried sails wrapped and bound, there was not a person with a knife to cut the ropes. In some boats, the plugs in the bottom had been pulled out, and the women passengers were compelled to thrust their hands into the holes to keep the boats from filling and sinking. The captain, E.J. Smith, Admiral of the White Star Fleet, went down with his ship. Chapter 1. First News of the Greatest Marine Disaster in History. The Titanic in Collision, but Everybody's Safe. Another triumph set down to wireless telegraphy. The world goes to sleep peacefully. The sad awakening. Like a bolt out of a clear sky came the wireless message on Monday, April 15, 1912, that on Sunday night, the great Titanic on her maiden voyage across the Atlantic had struck a gigantic iceberg, but that all the passengers were saved. The ship had signaled her distress, and another victory was set down to wireless. 2,100 lives saved. Additional news was soon received that the ship had collided with a mountain of ice in the North Atlantic off Cape Race, Newfoundland at 1025 Sunday evening, April 14th. At 4.15 Monday morning, the Canadian Government Marine Agency received a wireless message that the Titanic was sinking and that the steamers towing her were trying to get her into shoal water near Cape Race for the purpose of beaching her. Wireless dispatches up to noon Monday showed that the passengers of the Titanic were being transferred aboard the steamer Carpathia, a Cunarder, which left New York April 13th for Naples. Twenty boatloads of the Titanic's passengers were said to have been transferred to the Carpathia then, and allowing 40 to 60 persons as the capacity of each lifeboat, some 800 or 1,200 persons had already been transferred from the damaged liner to the Carpathia. They were reported as being taken to Halifax, whence they would be sent by train to New York. Another liner, the Parisian of the Allen Company, which sailed from Glasgow for Halifax on April 6th, was said to be close at hand and assisting in the work of rescue. The Baltic, Virginian, and Olympic were also near the scene, according to the information received by wireless. 
while badly damaged the giant vessel was reported as still afloat but whether she could reach port or shoal water was uncertain the white star officials declared that the titanic was in no immediate danger of sinking because of her numerous watertight compartments while we are still lacking definite information mr franklin vice president of the white star line said later in the afternoon we believe the titanic's passengers will reach halifax wednesday evening we have received no further word from captain haddock of the olympic or from any of the ships in the vicinity but are confident that there will be no loss of life with the understanding that the survivors would be taken to halifax the line arranged to have thirty pullman cars two diners and many passenger coaches leave boston monday night for halifax to get the passengers after they were landed mr franklin made a guess that the titanic's passengers would get into halifax on wednesday the Department of Commerce and Labor notified the White Star Line that Customs and Immigration Inspectors would be sent from Montreal to Halifax in order that there would be as little delay as possible in getting the passengers on trains. Monday night, the world slept in peace and assurance. A wireless message had finally been received, reading, All Titanic's Passengers Safe. It was not until nearly a week later that the fact was discovered that this message had been wrongly received in the confusion of messages flashing through the air, and that in reality the message should have read, Are all Titanic's passengers safe? With the dawning of Tuesday morning came the awful news of the true sad fate of the Titanic. End of dedication introduction and chapter one of the sinking of the titanic and great sea disasters chapters two and three of the sinking of the titanic and great sea disasters this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapters 2 and 3. The Most Sumptuous Palace Afloat. Dimensions of the Titanic. Capacity. Provisions for the comfort and entertainment of passengers. Mechanical equipment. The army of attendants required. The statistical record of the great ship has news value at this time. Early in 1908, officials of the White Star Company announced they would eclipse all previous records in shipbuilding with a vessel of staggering dimensions. The Titanic resulted. The keel of the ill-fated ship was laid in the summer of 1909 at the Harland and Wolf Yards, Belfast. Lord Peary, considered one of the best authorities on shipbuilding in the world, was the designer. The Leviathan was launched on May 31, 1911, and was completed in February 1912 at a cost of $10 million. Sister Ship of Olympic The Titanic, largest liner in commission, was a sister ship to the Olympic. The registered tonnage of each vessel is estimated as 45,000, but officers of the White Star Line say that the Titanic measured 45,328 tons. The Titanic was commanded by Captain E.J. Smith, the White Star Admiral, who had previously been on the Olympic. She was 882 and a half long, or about four city blocks, and was 5,000 tons bigger than a battleship, twice as large as the dreadnought Delaware. Like her sister ship, the Olympic, the Titanic was a four-funneled vessel and had 11 decks. The distance from the keel to the top of the funnels was 175 feet. She had an average speed of 21 knots. The Titanic could accommodate 2,500 passengers. The steamship was divided into numerous compartments, separated by 15 bulkheads. She was equipped with a gymnasium, swimming pool, hospital with operating room, and a grill and palm garden carried crew of 860. The registered tonnage was 45,000 and the displacement tonnage 66,000. She was capable of carrying 2,500 passengers and the crew numbered 860. 
The largest plates employed in the hull were 36 feet long, weighing 43 and one half tons each, and the largest steel beam used was 92 feet long, the weight of this double beam being four tons. The rudder, which was operated electrically, weighed 100 tons. The anchors, 15 and one half tons each. The center turbine propeller, 22 tons. And each of the two wing propellers, 38 tons each. The after boss arms, from which were suspended the three propeller shafts, tipped the scales at 73 and one half tons, and the forward boss arms at 45 tons. Each link in the anchor chains weighed 175 pounds. There were more than 2,000 side lights and windows to light the public rooms and passenger cabins. Nothing was left to chance in the construction of the Titanic. Three million rivets, weighing 1,200 tons, held the solid plates of steel together. To ensure stability in binding the heavy plates in the double bottom, half a million rivets, weighing about 270 tons, were used. All the plating of the hulls was riveted by hydraulic power, driving seven-ton riveting machines suspended from traveling cranes. The double bottom extended the full length of the vessel, varying from five feet three inches to six feet three inches in depth, and lent added strength to the hull. Most luxurious steamship. Not only was the Titanic the largest steamship afloat, but it was the most luxurious. Elaborately furnished cabins opened onto her 11 decks, and some of these decks were reserved as private promenades that were engaged with the best suites. One of these suites sold for $4,350 for the boat's maiden and only voyage. Suites similar, but which were without the private promenade decks, sold for $2,300. The Titanic differed in some respects from her sister ship. The Olympic has a lower promenade deck, but in the Titanic's case, the staterooms were brought out flush with the outside of the superstructure, and the rooms themselves made much larger. The sitting rooms of some of the suites on this deck were 15 by 15 feet. The restaurant was much larger than that of the Olympic, and it had a novelty in the shape of a private promenade deck on the starboard side, to be used exclusively by its patrons. Adjoining it was a reception room, where hosts and hostesses could meet their guests. Two private promenades were connected with the two most luxurious suites on the ship. The suites were situated about amidships, one on either side of the vessel, and each was about 50 feet long. One of the suites comprised a sitting room, two bedrooms, and a bath. These private promenades were expensive luxuries. The cost figured out something like $40 a front foot for a six days voyage. They, with the suites to which they are attached, were the most expensive transatlantic accommodations yet offered. The engine room. The engine room was divided into two sections, one given to the reciprocating engines and the other to the turbines. There were two sets of the reciprocating kind, one working each of the wing propellers through a four-cylinder triple expansion, direct acting inverted engine. Each set could generate 15,000 indicated horsepower at 75 revolutions a minute. The Parsons type turbine takes steam from the reciprocating engines and by developing a horsepower of 16,000 at 165 revolutions a minute works the third of the ship's propellers, the one directly under the rudder. Of the four funnels of the vessel, three were connected with the engine room and the fourth or after funnel for ventilating the ship, including the gallery. Practically all of the space on the Titanic below the upper deck was occupied by steam generating plants, coal bunkers, and propelling machinery. Eight of the 15 watertight compartments contained mechanical part of the vessel. There were, for instance, 24 double end and five single end boilers, each 16 feet 9 inches in diameter, the larger 20 feet long, and the smaller 11 feet 9 inches long. The larger boilers had six fires under each of them and the smaller three furnaces. Coal was stored in a bunker space along the side of the ship between the lower and middle decks and was first shipped from there into bunkers running all the way across the vessel into the lowest part. 
One of the most interesting features of the vessel was the refrigerating plant, which comprised a huge ice-making and refrigerating machine and a number of provision rooms on the after part of the lower and orlop decks. There were separate cold rooms for beef, mutton, poultry, game, fish, vegetables, fruit, butter, bacon, cheese, flowers, mineral water, wine, spirits, and champagne, all maintained at different temperatures most suitable to each. Perishable freight had a compartment of its own, also chilled by the plant. Comfort and Stability Two main ideas were carried out in the Titanic. One was comfort and the other stability. The vessel was planned to be an ocean ferry. She was to have only a speed of 21 knots, far below that of some other modern vessels, but she was planned to make that speed blow high or blow low so that if she left one side of the ocean at a given time, she could be relied on to reach the other side at almost a certain minute of a certain hour. One who has looked into modern methods for safeguarding a vessel of the Titanic type can hardly imagine an accident that could cause her to founder. No collision such has been the fate of any ship in recent years. It has been thought up to this time could send her down. Nor could running against an iceberg do it unless such an accident were coupled with the remotely possible blowing out of a boiler. She would sink at once, probably, if she were to run over a submerged rock or derelict in such a manner that both her keel plates and her double bottom were torn away for more than half her length but such a catastrophe was so remotely possible that it did not even enter the field of conjecture. The reason for all this is found in the modern arrangement of watertight steel compartments into which all ships now are divided, and of which the Titanic had 15 so disposed that half of them, including the largest, could be flooded without impairing the safety of the vessel. Probably it was the working of these bulkheads and the watertight doors between them as they are supposed to work that saved the Titanic from foundering when she struck the iceberg. These bulkheads were of heavy sheet steel and started at the very bottom of the ship and extended right up to the top side. The openings in the bulkheads were just about the size of the ordinary doorway, but the doors did not swing as in a house, but fitted into watertight grooves above the opening. They could be released instantly in several ways, and once closed, formed a barrier to the water as solid as the bulkhead itself. In the Titanic, as in other great modern ships, these doors were held in place above the openings by friction clutches. On the bridge was a switch which connected with an electric magnet at the side of the bulkhead opening. The turning of the switch caused the magnet to draw down a heavy weight which instantly released the friction clutch and allowed the door to fall or slide down over the opening in a second. If, however, through accident, the bridge switch was rendered useless, the doors would close automatically in a few seconds. This was arranged by means of large metal floats at the sides of doorways, which rested just above the level of the double bottom, and as water entered the compartments, these floats would rise to it and directly release the clutch holding the door open. These clutches could also be released by hand. It was said of the Titanic that liner compartments could be flooded as far back or as far forward as the engine room and she would float, though she might take on a heavy list or settle considerably at one end. To provide against such an accident as she is said to have encountered, she had set back a good distance from the bows an extra heavy cross partition known as the collision bulkhead, which would prevent water getting in amidships, even though a good part of her bow should be torn away. What a ship can stand and still float was shown a few years ago when the Swevik of the White Star Line went on the rocks of the British coast. The wreckers could not move the forward part of her, so they separated her into two sections by the use of dynamite, and after putting in a temporary bulkhead, floated off the after half of the ship, put it in dry dock, and built a new forward part for her. More recently, the battleship Maine, or what was left of her, was floated out to sea and kept on top of the water by her watertight compartments only. Chapter 3 the Maiden Voyage of the Titanic Preparations for the Voyage Scenes of Gaiety The Boat Sails Incidents of the Voyage A Collision Nearly Averted The Boat on Fire Warned of Icebergs 
Ever was ill-starred voyage more auspiciously begun than when the Titanic, newly crowned Empress of the Seas, steamed majestically out of the port of Southampton at noon on Wednesday, April 10th, bound for New York. Elaborate preparations had been made for the maiden voyage. Crowds of eager watchers gathered to witness the departure, all the more interested because of the notable people who were to travel aboard her. Friends and relatives of many of the passengers were at the dock to bid Godspeed to their departing loved ones. The passengers themselves were unusually gay and happy. Majestic and beautiful, the ship rested on the water, marvel of shipbuilding, worthy of any sea. As this new queen of the ocean moved slowly from her dock, no one questioned her construction. She was fitted with an elaborate system of watertight compartments, calculated to make her unsinkable. She had been pronounced the safest as well as the most sumptuous Atlantic liner afloat. There was silence just before the boat pulled out, the silence that usually precedes the leave-taking. The heavy whistle sounded and the splendid Titanic, her flags flying and her band playing, churned the water and plowed heavily away. Then the Titanic, with the people on board waving handkerchiefs and shouting goodbyes that could be heard only as a buzzing murmur on shore, rode away on the ocean, proudly, majestically, her head up and, so it seemed, her shoulders thrown back. If ever a vessel seemed to throb with proud life, if ever a monster of the sea seemed to fill its oats and strain at the leash, if ever a ship seemed to have breeding and blue blood that would keep its going until its heart broke. That ship was the Titanic. And so it was only her due that as the Titanic steamed out of the harbor bound on her maiden voyage, a thousand godspeeds were wafted after her, while every other vessel that she passed, the greatest of them dwarfed by her colossal proportions, paid homage to the new queen regnant with the blasts of their whistles and the shrieking of steam sirens. The ship's captain. In command of the Titanic was Captain E. J. Smith, a veteran of the seas and admiral of the White Star Line fleet. The next six officers, in the order of their rank, were Murdoch, Lightoller, Pittman, Boxhall, Lowe, and Moody. Dan Phillips was chief wireless operator, with Harold Bride as assistant. From the forward bridge, fully ninety feet above the sea, peered out the benign face of the ship's master. Cool of aspect, deliberate of action, impressive in that quality of confidence that is bred only of long experience in command. From far below the bridge sounded the strains of the ship's orchestra, playing blithely a favorite air from The Chocolate Soldier. All went as merry as a wedding bell. Indeed, among that gay ship's company were two score or more at least for whom the wedding bells had sounded in truth not many days before. Some were on their honeymoon tours. Others were returning to their motherland after having passed the weeks of the honeymoon, like Colonel John Jacob Astor and his young bride, amid the diversions of Egypt or other old world countries. What daring flight of imagination would have ventured the prediction that within the span of six days that stately ship, humbled, shattered, and torn asunder, would lie two thousand fathoms deep at the bottom of the Atlantic, that the benign face that peered from the bridge would be set in the rigor of death, and that the happy bevy of voyaging brides would be sorrowing widows. Almost in a collision. The big vessel had, however, a touch of evil fortune before she cleared the harbor of Southampton. As she passed down her stream, her immense bulk, she displaced 66,000 tons, drew the waters after her with an irresistible suction that tore the American liner New York from her moorings. Seven steel hawsers were snapped like twine. The New York floated toward the White Star ship and would have rammed the new ship had not the tugs Vulcan and Neptune stopped her and towed her back to the quay. When the mammoth ship touched at Cherbourg and later at Queenstown, she was again the object of a port ovation. The smaller craft doing obeisance while thousands gazed in wonder at her stupendous proportions. 
After taking aboard some additional passengers at each port, the Titanic headed her towering bow toward the open sea, and the race for a record on her maiden voyage was begun. New burst of speed each day. The Titanic made 484 miles as her first day's run, her powerful new engines turning over at the rate of 70 revolutions. On the second day out, the speed was hit up to 73 revolutions, and the run for the day was bulletined at 519 miles. Still further increasing the speed, the rate of revolution of the engines was raised to 75, and the day's run was 549 miles, the best yet scheduled. But the ship had not yet been speeded to her capacity. She was capable of turning over about 78 revolutions. Had the weather conditions been propitious, it was intended to press the great racer to the full limit of her speed on Monday. But for the Titanic, Monday never came. Fire in the coal bunkers. Unknown to the passengers, the Titanic was on fire from the day she sailed from Southampton. Her officers and crew knew it, for they had fought the fire for days. This story, told for the first time by the survivors of the crew, was only one of the many thrilling tales of the fateful first voyage. The Titanic sailed from Southampton on Wednesday, April 10th at noon, said J. Dilly, a fireman on the Titanic. I was assigned to the Titanic from the Oceanic, where I had served as a fireman. From the day we sailed, the Titanic was on fire, and my sole duty, together with 11 other men, had been to fight that fire. We made no headway against it. Passengers in Ignorance Of course, he went on, the passengers knew nothing of the fire. Do you think we'd have let them know about it? No, sir. The fire started in bunker number six. There were hundreds of tons of coal stored there. The coal on top of the bunker was wet, as all the coal should have been. But down at the bottom of the bunker, the coal had been permitted to get dry. The dry coal at the bottom of the pile took fire and smoldered for days. The wet coal on top kept the flames from coming through, but down in the bottom of the bunkers, the flames were raging. Two men from each watch of stokers were told off to fight that fire. The stokers worked four hours at a time, so 12 of us were fighting flames from the day we put out of Southampton until we hit the iceberg. No, we didn't get that fire out and among the stokers there was talk that we'd have to empty the big coal bunkers after we'd put our passengers off in New York and then call on the fire boats there to help us put out the fire. The stokers were alarmed over it, but the officers told us to keep our mouths shut. They didn't want to alarm the passengers. Usual Diversion Until Sunday, April 14th, then the voyage had apparently been a delightful but uneventful one. The passengers had passed the time in the usual diversions of ocean travelers, amusing themselves in the luxurious saloons, promenading on the boat deck, lolling at their ease in the steamer chairs, and making pools on the daily runs of the steamship. The smoking rooms and card rooms had been as well patronized as usual, and a party of several notorious professional gamblers had begun reaping their usual easy harvest. As early as Sunday afternoon, the officers of the Titanic must have known that they were approaching dangerous ice fields of the kind that are a perennial menace to the safety of steamships following the regular transatlantic lanes off the Great Banks of Newfoundland. An Unheeded Warning On Sunday afternoon, the Titanic's wireless operator forwarded to the hydrographic office in Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and elsewhere the following dispatch. April 14th, the German steamship America, Hamburg American Line, reports by radio telegraph passing two large icebergs in latitude 41.27, longitude 50.08, Titanic, BRSS. Despite this warning, the Titanic forged ahead Sunday night at her usual speed from 21 to 25 knots. End of chapters 2 and 3 of The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters, edited by Logan Marshall. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapters 4 and 5. Some of the Notable Passengers. The ship's company was of a character befitting the greatest of all vessels and worthy of the occasion of her maiden voyage. Though the major part of her passengers were Americans returning from abroad, there were enrolled upon her cabin list some of the most distinguished names of England, as well as of the younger nation. Many of these had purposely delayed sailing, or had hastened their departure, that they may be among the first passengers on the great vessel. There were aboard six men whose fortunes ran into tens of millions, besides many other persons of international note. Among the men were leaders in the world of commerce, finance, literature, art, and the learned professions. Many of the women were socially prominent in two hemispheres. Wealth and fame, unfortunately, are not proof against fate and most of these notable personages perished as pitiably as the more humble steerage passengers. The list of notables included Colonel John Jacob Astor, head of the Astor family, whose fortune is estimated at $150 million, Isidore Strauss, merchant and banker, $50 million, J. Bruce Ismay, J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the International Mercantile Marine, forty million dollars benjamin guggenheim head of the guggenheim family ninety five million dollars george d widener son of p a b widener traction magnet and financier five million dollars colonel washington roebling builder of the great brooklyn bridge charles m hayes president of the grand trunk railway w t steed famous publicist jacques Futrelle, journalist Harry S. Harper of the firm Harper & Brothers, Henry B. Harris, theatrical manager, Major Archibald Butt, military aide to President Taft, and Francis D. Millet, one of the best known American painters. Major Butt. Major Archibald Butt, whose bravery on the sinking vessel will not soon be forgotten, was military aide to President Taft and was known wherever the president traveled. His recent European mission was apparently to call on the Pope in behalf of President Taft, for on March 21st, he was received at the Vatican and presented to the Pope a letter from Mr. Taft thanking the pontiff for the creation of three new American cardinals. Major Butt had a reputation as a horseman, and it is said he was able to keep up with President Roosevelt, be the ride ever so far or fast. He was promoted to the rank of major in 1911. He sailed for the Mediterranean on March 2nd with his friend Francis D. Millet, the artist, who also perished on the Titanic. Colonel Astor John Jacob Astor was returning from a trip to Egypt with his 19-year-old bride, formerly Miss Madeline Force, to whom he was married in Providence September 9, 1911. He was head of the family whose name he bore and one of the world's wealthiest men. He was not, however, one of the world's idle rich, for his life of 47 years was a well-filled one. He had managed the family estate since 1891, built the Astor Hotel in New York, was colonel on the staff of Governor Levi P. Morton, and in May of 1898 was commissioned colonel of the United States Volunteers. After assisting Major General Breckinridge, Inspector General of the United States Army, he was assigned to duty on the staff of Major General Shafter and served in Cuba during the operations ending the surrender of Santiago. He was also the inventor of a bicycle brake, a pneumatic road improver, and an improved turbine engine. Benjamin Guggenheim Next to Colonel Astor in financial importance was Benjamin Guggenheim, whose father founded the famous house of M. Guggenheim and Sons. When the various Guggenheim interests were consolidated into the American Smelting and Refining Company, he retired from active business, although he later became interested in the Power and Mining Machinery Company of Milwaukee. 
In 1894, he married Miss Floretta Seligman, daughter of James Seligman, the New York banker. Isidore Strauss Isidore Strauss, whose wife elected to perish with him in the ship, was a brother of Nathan and Oscar Strauss, a partner with Nathan Strauss in R. H. Macy and Company, and L. Strauss and Sons a member of the firm of Abraham and Strauss in Brooklyn, and has been well known in politics and charitable work. He was a member of the 53rd Congress from 1893 to 1895, and as a friend of William L. Wilson, was in constant consultation in the matter of the former Wilson Tariff Bill. Mr. Strauss was conspicuous for his works of charity and was an ardent supporter of every enterprise to improve the condition of the Hebrew immigrants. He was president of the Educational Alliance, vice president of the J. Hood Wright Memorial Hospital, a member of the Chamber of Commerce, on one of the visiting committees of Harvard University, and was besides a trustee of many financial and philanthropic institutions. Mr. Strauss never enjoyed a college education. He was, however, one of the best informed men of his day, his information having been derived from extensive reading. His library, said to be one of the finest and most extensive in New York, was his pride and his place of special recreation. George D. Widener The best known of Philadelphia passengers aboard the Titanic were Mr. and Mrs. George D. Widener. Mr. Widener was a son of Peter A. B. Widener and, like his father, was recognized as one of the foremost financiers of Philadelphia, as well as a leader in society there. Mr. Widener married Miss Eleanor Elkins, a daughter of the late William L. Elkins. They made their home with his father at the latter's fine place at Eastburn, 10 miles from Philadelphia. Mr. Widener was keenly interested in horses and was a constant exhibitor at horse shows. In business, he was recognized as his father's chief advisor in managing the latter's extensive traction interests. P. A. B. Widener is a director of the International Mercantile Marine. Mrs. Widener is said to be the possessor of one of the finest collections of jewels in the world, the gift of her husband. One string of pearls in this collection was reported to be worth $250,000. The Wideners went abroad two months previous to the disaster, Mr. Widener desiring to inspect some of his business interests on the other side. At the opening of the London Museum by King George on March 21st, last it was announced that Mrs. Widener had presented to the museum 30 silver plates, once the property of Neil Gwynne. Mr. Widener is survived by a daughter, Eleanor, and a son, George D. Widener. Junior Harry Elkins Widener was with his parents and went down with the ship. Colonel Roebling Colonel Washington Augustus Roebling was president of the John A. Roebling Sons Company, manufacturers of iron and steel wire rope. He served in the Union Army from 1861 to 1865, resigning to assist his father in the construction of the Cincinnati and Covington Suspension Bridge. At the death of his father in 1869, he took entire charge of the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge, and it is said to his genius that the success of that great work may be said to be due. William T. Steed one of the most notable of the foreign passengers was William T. Steed. Few names are more widely known to the world of contemporary literature and journalism than that of the brilliant editor of the Review of Reviews. Matthew Arnold called him the inventor of the new journalism in England. He was on his way to America to take part in the Men and Religion Forward movement and was to have delivered an address in Union Square on the Thursday after the disaster, with William Jennings Bryan as his chief associate. Mr. Steed was an earnest advocate of peace and had written many books. His commentary, If Christ Came to Chicago, raised a storm 20 years ago. When he was in this country in 1907, he addressed a session of Methodist clergymen, and at one juncture of the meeting, remarked that unless the Methodists did something about the peace movement besides shouting amen, nobody would care a damn about their amens. Other Englishmen Aboard Other distinguished Englishmen on the Titanic were Norman C. Craig, MP, Thomas Andrews, 
a representative of the firm of Harland and Wolf of Belfast, the ship's builders, and J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line. J. Bruce Ismay. Mr. Ismay is president and one of the founders of the International Mercantile Marine. He has made it a custom to be a passenger on the maiden voyage of every new ship built by the White Star Line. It was Mr. Ismay who, with J.P. Morgan, consolidated the British steamship lines under the International Mercantile Marine's control, and it is largely due to his imagination that such gigantic ships as the Titanic and the Olympic were made possible. Jacques Futrelle Jacques Futrelle was an author of short stories, some of which have appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, and of many novels of the same general type as The Thinking Machine, with which he first gained a wide popularity. Newspaper work, chiefly in Richmond, Virginia, engaged his attention from 1890 to 1909, in which year he entered the theatrical business as a manager. In 1904, he returned to his journalistic career. Henry B. Harris Henry B. Harris, the theater manager, had been manager of May Irwin, Peter Daly, Lily Langtree, Amelia Bingham, and launched Robert Edison as star. He became the manager of the Hudson Theater in 1903 and the Hackett Theater in 1906. Among his best known productions are The Lion and the Mouse, The Traveling Salesman, and The Third Degree. He was president of the Henry B. Harris Company, controlling the Harris Theater. Young Harris had a liking for the theatrical business from a boy. Twelve years ago, Mr. Harris married Miss Renee Wallach of Washington. He was said to have a fortune of between one million and three million dollars. He owned outright the Hudson and the Harris theaters and had an interest in two other show houses in New York. He owned three theaters in Chicago, one in Syracuse and one in Philadelphia. Henry S. Harper Henry Sleeper Harper, who was among the survivors, is a grandson of John Wesley Harper, one of the founders of Harper Publishing Business. H. Sleeper Harper was himself an incorporator of Harper & Brothers when the firm became a corporation in 1896. He had a desk in the offices of the publishers, but his hand of late years in the management of the business has been very slight. He has been active in the work of keeping the Adirondack forests free from aggression. He was in the habit of spending about half of his time in foreign travel. His friends in New York recall that he had a narrow escape about 10 years ago when a ship in which he was traveling ran into an iceberg on the Grand Banks. Francis David Millet Millet was one of the best known American painters and many of his canvases are found in the leading galleries of the world. He served as a drummer boy with the 60th Massachusetts Volunteers in the Civil War and from early manhood took a prominent part in public affairs. He was director of the decorations for the Chicago Exposition and was, at the time of the disaster, secretary of the American Academy in Rome. He was a wide traveler and the author of many books besides translations of Tolstoy. Charles M. Hayes Another person of prominence was Charles Melville Hayes, president of the Grand Trunk and the Grand Trunk Pacific Railways. He was described by Sir Wilfrid Laurier at a dinner of the Canadian Club of New York at the Hotel Astor last year as beyond question the greatest railroad genius in Canada, as an executive genius ranking second only to the late Edward H. Harriman. He was returning aboard the Titanic with his wife and son-in-law and daughter, Mr. and Mrs. Thornton Davidson of Montreal. End of chapter four. Chapter five of Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters, edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 5. The Titanic Strikes an Iceberg. Tardy attention to warning responsible for accident. The danger not realized at first. An interrupted card game. Passengers joke among themselves. The real truth dawns. Panic on board. Wireless calls for help. 
Sunday night the magnificent ocean liner was plunging through a comparatively placid sea, on the surface of which there was much mushy ice and here and there a number of comparatively harmless-looking floats. The night was clear and stars visible. First Officer William T. Murdoch was in charge of the bridge. The first intimation of the presence of the iceberg that he received was from the lookout in the crow's nest. Three warnings were transmitted from the crow's nest of the Titanic to the officer on the doomed steamship's bridge 15 minutes before she struck, according to Thomas Whiteley, a first saloon steward. Whiteley, who was whipped overboard from the ship by a rope while helping to lower a lifeboat, finally reported on the Carpathia aboard one of the boats that contained, he said, both the crow's nest lookouts. He heard a conversation between them, he asserted, in which they discussed the warnings given to the Titanic's bridge of the presence of the iceberg. Whiteley did not know the names of either of the lookout men and believed that they returned to England with the majority of the surviving members of the crew. I heard one of them say that at 11 of 15 o'clock, 15 minutes before the Titanic struck, he had reported to First Officer Murdoch on the bridge that he fancied he saw an iceberg, said Whiteley. Twice after that, the lookout said, he warned Murdoch that a berg was ahead. They were very indignant that no attention was paid to their warnings. Tardy attention to warning responsible for accident. Murdoch's tardy answering of a telephone call from the crow's nest is assigned by Whiteley as the cause of the disaster. When Murdoch answered the call, he received the information that the iceberg was due ahead. This information was imparted just a few seconds before the crash, and had the officer promptly answered the ring of the bell, it is probable that the accident could have been avoided, or at least been reduced by the lowered speed. The lookout saw a towering blue berg looming up in the sea path of the Titanic, and called the bridge on the ship's telephone. When, after the passing of those two or three fateful minutes, an officer on the bridge lifted the telephone receiver from its hook to answer the lookout, it was too late. The speeding liner, cleaving a calm sea under a star-studded sky, had reached the floating mountain of ice, which the theoretically unsinkable ship struck a crashing, if glancing, blow with her starboard bow. Murdoch paid with life. Had Murdoch, according to the account of the tragedy given by two of the Titanic seamen, known how imperative was that call from the lookout man, the men at the wheel of the liner might have swerved the great ship sufficiently to avoid the berg altogether. At the worst, the vessel would probably have struck the mass of ice with her stern. Murdoch, if the tale of the Titanic sailor be true, expiated his negligence by shooting himself within sight of all the alleged victims huddled in lifeboats or struggling in the icy seas. When at last the danger was realized, the great ship was so close upon the berg that it was practically impossible to avoid collision with it. Vain Trial to Clear Berg The first officer did what other startled and alert commanders would have done under similar circumstances. That is, he made an effort by going full speed ahead on the starboard propeller and reversing his port propeller simultaneously throwing his helm over to make a rapid turn and clear the berg. The maneuver was not successful. He succeeded in saving his bows from crashing into the ice cliff, but nearly the entire length of the underbody of the great ship on the starboard side was ripped. The speed of the Titanic, estimated to be at least 21 knots, was so terrific that the knife-like edge of the iceberg spur protruding under the sea cut through her like a can opener. The Titanic was in 41.46 north latitude and 50.14 west longitude when she was struck, very near the spot on the wide Atlantic where the Carmania encountered a field of ice studded with great bergs on her voyage to New York, which ended on April 14th. It was really an ice pack due to an unusually severe winter in the North Atlantic. No less than 25 bergs, some of great height, were counted. The shock was almost imperceptible. The first officer did not apparently realize that the great ship had received her death wound, and none of the passengers had the slightest suspicion that anything more than a usual minor sea accident had happened. Hundreds who had gone to their berths and were asleep were unawakened by the vibration. Bridge game, not disturbed. T. 
To illustrate the placidity with which practically all men regarded the accident, it is related that the Pierre Maricol, son of the vice admiral of the French Navy, Lucien Smith, Paul Chevry, a French sculptor, and A. F. Ormont, a cotton broker, were in the Café Parisian playing bridge. The four calmly got up from the table, and after walking on deck and looking over the rail, returned to their game. One of them had left his cigar on the card table, and while the three others were gazing out on the sea, he remarked he couldn't afford to lose his smoke, returned for his cigar, and came out again. They remained only for a few moments on deck, and then resumed their game under the impression that the ship had stopped for reasons best known to the captain and not involving any danger to her. Later, in describing the scene that took place, M. Marichal, who was among the survivors, said, when three quarters of a mile away we stopped, the spectacle before our eyes was in its way magnificent. In a very calm sea, beneath a sky moonless, but sown with millions of stars, the enormous Titanic lay on the water, illuminated from the water line to the boat deck. The bow was slowly sinking into the black water. The tendency of the whole ship's company, except the men in the engine department, who were made aware of the danger by the inrushing water, was to make light of, and in some instances, even to ridicule the thought of danger so substantial a fabric. The Captain on Deck When Captain Smith came from the chart room onto the bridge, his first words were, Close the emergency doors. They're already closed, sir, Mr. Murdoch replied. "'Send to the carpenter and tell him to sound the ship,' was the next order. The message was sent to the carpenter, but the carpenter never came up to report. He was probably the first man on the ship to lose his life. The captain then looked at the communicator, which shows in what direction the ship is listing. He saw that she carried five degrees list to starboard. The ship was then rapidly settling forward. All the steam sirens were blowing. By the captain's orders, given in the next few minutes, the engines were put to work at pumping out the ship, distress signals were sent by the Marconi, and rockets were sent up from the bridge by Quartermaster Rowe. All hands were ordered on deck. Passengers not alarmed. The blasting shriek of the sirens had not alarmed the great company of the Titanic, because such steam calls are an incident of travel in seas where fogs roll. Many had gone to bed, but the hour, 11.40 p.m., was not too late for the friendly contact of saloons and smoking rooms. It was Sunday night, and the ship's concert had ended, but there were many hundreds up and moving among the gay lights, and many on deck with their eyes strained toward the mysterious west, where home lay. And in one jarring, breath-sweeping moment, all of these, asleep or awake, were at the mercy of chance. Few among the more than 2,000 aboard could have had a thought of danger. The man who had stood up in the smoking room to say the Titanic was vulnerable, or that in a few minutes two-thirds of her people would be face to face with death, would have been considered a fool or a lunatic. No ship ever sailed the seas that gave her passengers more confidence, more cool security. Within a few minutes, stewards and other members of the crew were sent round to arouse people. Some utterly refused to get up. The stewards had almost to force the doors of the staterooms to make the somnolent appreciate their peril, and many of them, it is believed, were drowned like rats in a trap. Astor and wife strolled on deck. Colonel and Mrs. Astor were in their room and saw the ice vision flash by. They had not appreciably felt the gentle shock and supposed that nothing out of the ordinary had happened. They were both dressed and came on deck leisurely. William T. Steed, the London journalist, wandered on deck for a few minutes, stopping to talk to Frank Millet. What do they say is the trouble? he asked. Icebergs, was the brief reply. Well, said Steed, I guess it is nothing serious. I'm going back to my cabin to read. From end to end on the mighty boat, officers were rushing about without much noise or confusion, but giving orders sharply. Captain Smith told the third officer to rush downstairs and see whether the water was coming in very fast. And, he added, take some armed guards along to see that the stokers and engineers stay at their posts. In two minutes, the officer returned. 
"'It looks pretty bad, sir,' he said. "'The water is rushing in and filling the bottom. "'The locks of the watertight compartments have been sprung by the shock. "'Give the command for all passengers to be on deck with life belts on.' Through the length and breadth of the boat, upstairs and downstairs, on all decks, the cry rang out, All passengers on deck with life preservers. A sudden tremor of fear. For the first time, there was a feeling of panic. Husbands sought for wives and children. Families gathered together. Many who were asleep hastily caught up their clothing and rushed on deck. A moment before, the men had been joking about the life belts, according to the story told by Mrs. Vera Dick of Calgary, Canada. Try this one, one man said to her. They're the very latest thing this season. Everybody's wearing them now. Another man suggested to a woman friend, who had a fox terrier in her arms, that she should put a lifesaver on the dog. It won't fit, the woman replied, laughing. Make him carry it in his mouth, said the friend. CONFUSION AMONG THE IMMIGRANTS Below, on the steerage deck, there was intense confusion. About the time the officers on the first deck gave the order that all men should stand to one side and all women should go below to deck B, taking the children with them, a similar order was given to the steerage passengers. The women were ordered to the front, the men to the rear. Half a dozen healthy, husky immigrants pushed their way forward and tried to crowd into the first boat. "'Stand back!' shouted the officers who were manning the boat. "'The women come first. Shouting curses in various foreign languages, the immigrant men continued their pushing and tugging to climb into boats. Shots rang out. One big fellow fell over the railing into the water. Another dropped to the deck, moaning. His jaw had been shot away. This was the story told by the bystanders afterward on the pier. One husky Italian told the rider on the pier that the way in which the men were shot down was horrible. His sympathy was with the men who were shot. They were only trying to save their lives, he said. Wireless operator died at his post. On board the Titanic, the wireless operator, with a life belt about his waist, was hitting the instrument that was sending out the CQD messages. Struck on iceberg, CQD. "'Shall I tell Captain to turn back and help?' flashed a reply from the Carpathia. "'Yes, old man,' the Titanic wireless operator responded. "'Guess we're sinking.' An hour later, when the second wireless man came into the box-like room to tell his companion what the situation was, he found a Negro stoker creeping up behind the operator and saw him raise a knife over his head. He said afterwards, he was among those rescued, that he realized at once that the Negro intended to kill the operator in order to take his life belt from him. The second operator pulled out his revolver and shot the Negro dead. What was the trouble? asked the operator. That Negro was going to kill you and steal your life belt, the second man replied. Thanks, old man, said the operator. The second man went on deck to get some more information. He was just in time to jump overboard before the Titanic went down. The wireless operator and the body of the Negro who tried to steal his belt went down together. On the deck, where the first-class passengers were quartered, known as Deck A, there was none of the confusion that was taking place on the lower decks. The Titanic was standing without much rocking. The captain had given an order, and the band was playing. End of Chapter 5 of The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters Read by Allison Hester Chapter 6 of The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 6 Women and Children First. Cool-headed officers and crew bring order out of chaos. Filling the lifeboats. Heart-rending scenes as families are parted. Four lifeboats lost. Incidents of bravery. The boats are filled. Once on the deck, many hesitated to enter the swinging lifeboats. The glassy sea, the starlit sky, the absence, in the first few moments, of intense excitement gave them the feeling that there was only some slight mishap. 
that those who got into the boats would have a chilly half hour below and might later be laughed at it was such a feeling as this from all accounts which caused john jacob astor and his wife to refuse the places offered them in the first boat and to retire to the gymnasium in the same way h j allison a montreal banker laughed at the warning and his wife reassured by him took her time dressing they and their daughter did not reach the carpathia their son less than two years old was carried into a lifeboat by his nurse and was taken in charge by major arthur puchin the lifeboats lowered the admiration felt by the passengers and crew for the matchlessly appointed vessel was translated in those first few moments into a confidence which for some proved deadly the pulsing of the engines had ceased and the steamship lay just as though she were awaiting the order to go on again after some trifling matter had been adjusted but in a few minutes the canvas covers were lifted from the lifeboats and the crews allotted to each standing by ready to lower them into the water nearly all the boats that were lowered on the port side of the ship touched the water without capsizing four of the others lowered to starboard including one collapsible were capsized all however who were in the collapsible boats that practically went to pieces were rescued by the other boats presently the order was heard all men stand back and all women retire to the deck below that was the smoking room deck or the b deck the men stood away and remained in absolute silence leaning against the rail or pacing up and down the deck slowly many of them lighted cigars or cigarettes and began to smoke loading the boats the boats were swung out and lowered from the a deck above the women were marshaled quietly in lines along the b deck and when the boats were lowered down to the level of the ladder the women were assisted to climb into them as each of the boats was filled with its quota of passengers the word was given and it was carefully lowered down to the dark surface of the water nobody seemed to know how mr ismay got into a boat but it was assumed that he wished to make a presentation of the case of the titanic to his company he was among those who apparently realized that the splendid ship was doomed all hands in the lifeboats under instructions from officers and men in charge were rowed a considerable distance from the ship herself in order to get away from the possible suction that would follow her foundering coolest men on board captain smith and major archibald butt military aide to the president of the united states were among the coolest men on board a number of steerage passengers were yelling and screaming and fighting to get to the boats officers drew guns and told them that if they moved towards the boats they would be shot dead major butt had a gun in his hand and covered the men who tried to get to the boats the following story of his bravery was told by mrs henry b harris wife of the theatrical manager the world should rise in praise of major butt that man's conduct will remain in my memory forever the american army is honored by him and the way he taught some of the other men how to behave when women and children were suffering that awful mental fear of death major butt was near me and i noticed everything that he did when the order to man the boats came the captain whispered something to major butt the two of them had become friends the major immediately became as one in supreme command you would have thought he was at a white house reception a dozen or more women became hysterical all at once as something connected with a lifeboat went wrong major butt stepped over to them and said really you must not act like that we were all going to see you through this thing he helped the sailors rearrange the rope or chain that had gone wrong and lifted some of the women in with a touch of gallantry not only was there a complete lack of any fear in his manner but there was the action of an aristocrat when the time came he was a man to be feared in one of the earlier boats fifty women it seemed were about to be lowered when a man suddenly panic-stricken ran to the stern of it major butt shot one arm out caught him by the back of the neck and jerked him backward like a pillow his head cracked against a rail and he was stunned sorry said major butt women will be attended to first or i'll break every damn bone in your body forest men usurping places to vacate 
The boats were lowered one by one, and as I stood by, my husband said to me, Thank God for Archie Butt. Perhaps Major Butt heard it, for he turned his face towards us for a second and smiled. Just at that moment, a young man was arguing to get into a lifeboat, and Major Butt had a hold of the lad by the arm, like a big brother, and was telling him to keep his head and be a man. Major Butt helped those poor frightened steerage people so wonderfully, so tenderly, and yet with such cool and manly firmness that he prevented the loss of many lives from panic. He was a soldier to the last. He was one of God's greatest noblemen, and I think I can say he was an example of bravery, even to men on the ship. Last words of Major Butt. Miss Marie Young, who was a music instructor to President Roosevelt's children and had known Major Butt during the Roosevelt occupancy of the White House, told this story of his heroism. Archie himself put me into the boat, wrapped blankets around me, and tucked me in as carefully as if we were starting on a motor ride. He himself entered the boat with me, performing the little courtesies as calmly and with as smiling a face as if death were far away, instead of being but a few moments removed from him. When he had carefully wrapped me up, he stepped upon the gunwale of the boat, and lifting his hat, smiled down at me. "'Good-bye, Miss Young,' he said." Good luck to you, and don't forget to remember me to the folks back home. Then he stepped back and waved his hand to me as the boat was lowered. I think I was the last woman he had a chance to help, for the boat went down shortly after we cleared the suction zone. Colonel Astor, another hero. Colonel Astor was another of the heroes of the awful night. Effort was made to persuade him to take a place in one of the lifeboats but he emphatically refused to do so until every woman and child on board had been provided for, not excepting the women members of the ship's company. One of the passengers describing the consummate courage of Colonel Astor said, He led Mrs. Astor to the side of the ship and helped her to the lifeboat to which she had been assigned. I saw that she was prostrated and said she would remain and take her chances with him. But Colonel Astor quietly insisted and tried to reassure her in a few words. As she took her place in the boat, her eyes were fixed upon him. Colonel Astor smiled, touched his cap, and when the boat moved safely away from the ship's side, he turned back to his place among the men. Mrs. Ida S. Hippach and her daughter Jean, survivors of the Titanic, said they were saved by Colonel John Jacob Astor, who forced the crew of the last lifeboat to wait for them. We saw Colonel Astor place Mrs. Astor in a boat and assure her that he would follow her later, said Mrs. Hippich. He turned to us with a smile and said, Ladies, you are next. The officer in charge of the boat protested that the craft was full and the seamen started to lower it. Colonel Astor exclaimed, Hold that boat, in the voice of a man accustomed to being obeyed, and they did as he ordered. The boat had been lowered past the upper deck, and the colonel took us to the deck below and put us in the boat, one after the other, through a porthole. Heartbreaking Scenes There were some terrible scenes. Fathers were parting from their children and giving them an encouraging pat on the shoulders. Men were kissing their wives and telling them that they would be with them shortly. One man said there was absolutely no danger, that the boat was the finest ever built with watertight compartments, and that it could not sink. That seemed to be the general impression. A few of the men, however, were panic-stricken even when the first of the 56-foot lifeboats was being filled. Fully ten men threw themselves into the boats already crowded with women and children. These men were dragged back and hurled sprawling across the deck. Six of them screamed with fear, struggled to their feet, and made a second attempt to rush the boats. About ten shots sounded in quick succession. The six cowardly men were stopped in their tracks, staggered and collapsed one after another. At least two of them vainly attempted to creep towards the boats again. The others lay quite still. This scene of bloodshed served its purpose. In that particular section of the deck, there was no further attempt to violate the rule of women and children first. I helped fill the boats with women, said Thomas Whiteley, who was a waiter on the Titanic. Collapsible boat number two on the starboard side jammed. 
The second officer was hacking at the ropes with a knife when I was being dragged around the deck by that rope when I looked up and saw the boat, with all aboard, turn turtle. In some way, I got overboard myself and clung to an oak dresser. I wasn't more than 60 feet from the Titanic when she went down. Her big stern rose up in the air, and she went down bow first. I saw all the machinery drop out of her. Henry B. Harris Henry B. Harris of New York, a theatrical manager, was one of the men who showed superb courage in the crisis. When the lifeboats were first being filled, and before there was any panic, Mr. Harris went to the side of his wife before the boat was lowered away. "'Women first! shouted one of the ship's officers. Mr. Harris glanced up and saw that the remark was addressed to him. "'All right,' he replied coolly. "'Goodbye, my dear.' he said as he kissed his wife, pressed her a moment to his breast, and then climbed back to the Titanic's deck. Three Explosions Up to this time there had been no panic, but about one hour before the ship plunged to the bottom, there were three separate explosions of bulkheads as the vessel filled. These were at intervals of about fifteen minutes. From that time there was a different scene. The rush for the remaining boats became a stampede. The stokers rushed up from below and tried to beat a path through the steerage men and women and through the sailors and officers to get into the boats. They had their iron bars and shovels, and they struck down all who stood in their way. The first to come up from the depths of the ship was an engineer. From what he is reported to have said, it is probable that the steam fittings were broken, and many were scalded to death when the Titanic lifted. He said he had to dash through a narrow place beside a broken pipe, and his back was frightfully scalded. Right at his heels came the stokers. The officers had pistols, but they could not use them at first for fear of killing the women and children. The sailors fought with their fists, and many of them took the stoke bars and shovels from the stokers and used them to beat back the others. Many of the coal passers and stokers who had been driven back from the boats went to the rail, and whenever a boat was filled and lowered, several of them jumped overboard and swam toward it, trying to climb aboard. Several of the survivors said that the men who swam to the sides of their boats were pulled in or climbed in. Dozens of the cabin passengers were witnesses of some of the frightful scenes on the steerage deck. The steerage survivors said that ten women from the upper decks were the only cool passengers in the lifeboat, and they tried to quiet the steerage women, who were nearly all crazed with fear and grief other heroes. Among the chivalrous young heroes of the Titanic disaster were Washington A. Roebling and Howard Case, London representative of the Vacuum Oil Company. Both were urged repeatedly to take places in lifeboats, but scorned the opportunity while working against time to save the women aboard the ill-fated ship. They went to their death, it is said by survivors, with smiles on their faces. Both of these young men aided in the saving of Mrs. William T. Graham, wife of the president of the American Can Company, and Mrs. Graham's 19-year-old daughter, Margaret. Afterwards, relating some of her experiences, Mrs. Graham said, There was a rap at the door. It was a passenger whom we had met shortly after the ship left Liverpool, and his name was Roebling, Washington A. Roebling. He was a gentleman and a brave man, he warned us of the danger and told us it would be best to be prepared for an emergency. We heeded his warning, and I looked out of my window and saw a great big iceberg facing us. Immediately I knew what had happened, and we lost no time after that to get out into the saloon. In one of the gangways, I met an officer of the ship. "'What's the matter?' I asked him. "'We've only burst two pipes,' he said. "'Everything is all right. Don't worry.' "'But what makes the ship list so?' I asked. Oh, that's nothing, he replied, and walked away. Mr. Case advised us to get into a boat. And what are you going to do? we asked him. Oh, he replied, I'll take a chance and stay here. Just at that time, they were filling up the third lifeboat on the port side of the ship. I thought at the time that it was the third boat which had been lowered, but I found out later that they had lowered other boats on the other side, where the people were more excited because they were sinking on that side. Just then, Mr. Roebling came up too and told us to hurry and get into the third boat. Mr. Roebling and Mr. Case bustled our party of three into that boat in less time than it takes to tell it. 
They were both working hard to help the women and children. The boat was fairly crowded when we three were pushed into it, and a few men jumped in at the last moment. But Mr. Roebling and Mr. Case stood at the rail and made no attempt to get into the boat. They shouted goodbye to us. What do you think Mr. Case did then? He just calmly lighted a cigarette and waved us goodbye with his hand. Mr. Roebling stood there, too. I can see him now. I am sure that he knew that the ship would go to the bottom, but both just stood there. In the face of death. Scenes on the sinking vessel grew more tragic as the remaining passengers faced the awful certainty that death must be the portion of its majority. Death in the darkness of a wintry sea studded with its ice monuments like the marble shafts in some vast cemetery. In that hour, when cherished illusions of possible safety had all but vanished, manhood and womanhood aboard the Titanic rose to their sublimest heights. It was in that crisis of the direst extremity that many brave women deliberately rejected life and chose rather to remain and die with the men whom they loved. Death Fails to Part, Mr. and Mrs. Strauss I will not leave my husband said Mrs. Isidore Strauss. We are old, we can best die together. And she turned from those who would have forced her into one of the boats and clung to the man who had been the partner of her joys and sorrows. Thus they stood hand in hand and heart to heart, comforting each other until the sea claimed them, united in death as they had been through a long life. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Miss Elizabeth Evans fulfilled this final test of affection laid down by the Divine Master. The girl was the niece of the wife of Magistrate Cornell of New York. She was placed in the same boat with many other women. As it was about to be lowered away, it was found that the craft contained one more than its full quota of passengers. The grim question arose as to which of them should surrender her place and her chance of safety. Beside Miss Evans sat Mrs. J. J. Brown of Denver, the mother of several children. Miss Evans was the first to volunteer to yield to another. <clears throat> Girl steps back to doom. Your need is greater than mine, said she to Mrs. Brown. You have children who need you, and I have none. So saying, she arose from the boat and stepped back upon the deck. The girl found no later refuge and was one of those who went down with the ship. She was 25 years old and was beloved by all who knew her. Mrs. Brown thereafter showed the spirit which had made her also volunteer to leave the boat. There were only three men in the boat and but one of them rowed. Mrs. Brown, who was raised on the water, immediately picked up one of the heavy sweeps and began to pull. In the boat which carried Mrs. Cornell and Mrs. Appleton, there were places for 17 more than were carried. This, too, was undermanned, and the two women at once took their places at the oars. The Countess of Roths was pulling at the oars of her boat, likewise undermanned, because the crew preferred to stay behind. Miss Bentham of Rochester showed splendid courage. She happened to be in a lifeboat which was very much crowded so much so that one sailor had to sit with his feet dangling in the icy cold water, and as time went on, the sufferings of the man from the cold were apparent. Miss Bentham arose from her place and had the man turn around while she took his place with her feet in the water. Scarcely any of the lifeboats were properly manned. Two, filled with women and children, capsized immediately, while the collapsible boats were only temporarily useful. They soon filled with water, in one boat, 18 or 20 persons sat in water above their knees for six hours. The Lifeboats Being Lowered In one lifeboat, I saw an order for five pounds, which this man gave to each of the crew of his boat after they got aboard the Carpathia. It was on a piece of ordinary paper addressed to the Couts Bank of England. We called that boat the money boat. It was lowered from the starboard side and was one of the first off. Our orders were to load the lifeboats beginning forward on the port side, working aft, and then back on the starboard. This man paid the firemen to lower a starboard boat before the officers had given the order. Whiteley's own experience was a hard one. 
when the uncoiling rope which entangled his feet threw him into the sea it furrowed the flesh of his leg but he did not feel the pain until he was safe aboard the carpathia i floated on my life preserver for several hours he said then i came across a big oak dresser with two men clinging on it i hung on to this till daybreak and the two men dropped off when the sun came up i saw the collapsible raft in the distance just black with men they were all standing up and i swam to it almost a mile it seemed to me and they would not let me aboard mr lightoller the second officer was one of them it's thirty-one lives against yours he said you can't come aboard there's not room i pleaded with him in vain and then i confessed i prayed that somebody might die so i could take his place it was only human and then someone did die and they let me aboard by and by we saw seven lifeboats lashed together and we were taken into them men shot down the officers had to assert their authority by force and three foreigners from the steerage who tried to force their way in among the women and children were shot down without mercy robert daniel a philadelphia passenger told of a terrible scene at this period of the disaster he said men fought and bit and struck one another like madmen and exhibited wounds upon his face to prove the assertion. Mr. Daniel said that he was picked up naked from the ice-cold water and had almost perished from exposure before he was rescued. He and others told how the Titanic's bow was completely torn away by the impact with the berg. K. Whiteman of Palmyra, New Jersey, the Titanic's barber, was lowering boats on the deck after the collision and declared the officers on the bridge one of them first officer murdoch promptly worked the electrical apparatus for closing the watertight compartments he believed the machinery was in some way damaged by the crash that the front compartments failed to close tightly although the rear ones were secure whiteman's manner of escape was unique he was blown off the deck by the second of the two explosions of the boilers and was in the water more than two hours before he was picked up by a raft the explosions, Whiteman said, were caused by the rushing in of the icy water on the boilers. A bundle of deck chairs, roped together, was blown off the deck with me, and I struck my back, injuring my spine, but it served as a temporary raft. The crew and passengers had faith in the bulkhead system to save the ship, and we were lowering a collapsible boat, all confident the ship would get through when she took a terrific dip forward and the water swept over the deck and into the engine rooms the bow went clean down and i caught the pile of chairs as i was washed up against the rim then came the explosions which blew me fifteen feet after the water had filled the forward compartments the ones at the stern could not save her although they did delay the ships going down if it wasn't for the compartments hardly anyone could have gotten away a sad message one of the titanic stewards johnson by name carried this message to the sorrowing widow of benjamin guggenheim when mr guggenheim realized that there was grave danger said the room steward he advised his secretary who also died to dress fully and he himself did the same mr guggenheim who was cool and collected as he was pulling out on his outer garments said to the steward i am willing to remain and play the man's game if there are not enough boats for more than the women and children i won't die here like a beast i'll meet my end as a man there was a pause and then mr guggenheim continued tell my wife johnson if it should happen that my secretary and i both go down and you are saved tell her i played the game out straight and to the end no woman shall be left aboard this ship because ben guggenheim was a coward tell her my last thoughts will be of her and of our girls but that my duty now is to these unfortunate women and children on this ship tell her i will meet whatever fate is in store for me knowing she will approve of what i do in telling the story, the room steward said the last he saw of Mr. Guggenheim was when he stood fully dressed upon the upper deck, talking calmly with Colonel Astor and Major Butt. Before the last of the boats got away, according to some of the passengers' narratives, there were more than fifty shots fired upon the decks by officers or others in the effort to maintain the discipline that until then had been well preserved. The Sinking Vessel 
Richard Norris Williams, Jr., one of the survivors of the Titanic, saw his father killed by being crushed by one of the tremendous funnels of the sinking vessel. We stood on deck watching the lifeboats of the Titanic being filled and lowered into the water, said Mr. Williams. The water was nearly up to our waists, and the ship was about at her last. Suddenly, one of the great funnels fell. I sprang aside, endeavoring to pull my father with me. A moment later, the funnel was swept overboard, and the body of father went with it. I sprang overboard and swam through the ice to a life raft, and was pulled aboard. There were five men and one woman on the raft. Occasionally, we were swept off into the sea, but we always managed to crawl back. A sailor lighted a cigarette and flung the match carelessly among the women. Several screamed, fearing they would be set on fire. The sailor replied, We are going to hell anyway, and we might as well be cremated now as then. A huge cake of ice was the means of aiding Emile Portaleppi of Italy in his hair-breadth escape from death when the Titanic went down. Portaleppi, a second-class passenger, was awakened by the explosion of one of the bulkheads of the ship. He hurried to the deck, strapped a life preserver around him, and leaped into the sea. With the aid of the preserver, and by holding on to the, a cake of ice, he managed to keep afloat until one of the lifeboats picked him up. There were 35 other people in the boat, he said, when he was hauled aboard. The Coward Somewhere in the shadow of the appalling Titanic disaster slinks, still living by the inexplicable grace of God, a cur in human shape, today the most despicable human being in all the world. In that grim midnight hour, already great in history, he found himself hemmed in by the band of heroes whose watchword and countersign rang out across the deep, women and children first. What did he do? He scuttled to the stateroom deck, put on a woman's skirt, a woman's hat, and a woman's veil, and picking his crafty way back among the brave and chivalric men who guarded the rail of the doomed ship, he filched a seat in one of the lifeboats and saved his skin. His name is on that list of branded rescued men who were neither picked up from the sea when the ship went down, nor were in the boats under orders to help them get away safe. His identity is not yet known, though it will be in good time. So foul an act as that will out like murder. The eyes of strong men who have read this crowded record of golden deeds who have read and reread that deathless roll of honor of the dead are still wet with tears of pity and pride this man still lives surely he was born and saved to set for men a new standard by which to measure infamy and shame it is well that there was sufficient heroism on board the titanic to neutralize the horrors of cowardice when the first order was given for the men to stand back there were a dozen or more who pushed forward and said that men would be needed to row the lifeboats and that they would volunteer for the work. The officers tried to pick out the ones that volunteered merely for service and to eliminate those who volunteered merely to save their own lives. This elimination process, however, was not wholly successful. The Doomed Men As the ship began to settle to starboard, heeling at an angle of nearly 45 degrees, those who had believed it was all right to stick by the ship began to have doubts, and a few jumped into the sea. They were followed immediately by others, and in a few minutes there were scores swimming around. Nearly all of them were life preservers. One man, who had a Pomeranian dog, leaped overboard with it, and striking a piece of wreckage was badly stunned. He recovered after a few minutes and swam toward one of the lifeboats and was taken aboard said one survivor speaking of the men who remained on the ship there they stood major butt colonel astor waving a farewell to his wife mr thayer mr case mr clarence moore mr widener all multimillionaires and hundreds of other men bravely smiling at us all never have i seen such chivalry and fortitude such courage in the face of fate horrible to contemplate filled us even then with wonder and admiration why were men saved? Others who seek to make the occasional male survivor a hissing scorn. And yet the testimony makes it clear that for a long time during that ordeal, the more frightful position seemed to many to be in the frail boats in the vast relentless sea, and that some men had to be tumbled into the boat under orders from the officers. 
Others expressed the deepest indignation that 210 sailors were rescued. The testimony shows that most of these sailors were in the welter of ice and water into which they had been thrown from the ship's deck when she sank. They were human beings, and so were picked up and saved. Women and Children First the one alleviating circumstance in the otherwise immitigable tragedy is the fact that so many of the men stood aside really without the necessity for the order. Women and children first, and insisted that the weaker sex should first have places in the boats. There were men whose word of command swayed boards of directors, governed institutions, disposed of millions. They were accustomed merely to pronounce a wish to have it gratified. Thousands posted at their bidding, the complexion of the market altered hue when they nodded. They bought what they wanted, and for one of the humblest fishing smacks or a dory, they could have given the price that was paid to build and launch the ship that has become the most imposing mausoleum that ever housed the bones of men since the pyramids rose from the desert sands. But these men stood aside, one can see them, and gave place not merely to the delicate and the refined, but to the scared Czech woman from the steerage, with her baby at her breast, the Croatian with a toddler by her side, coming through the very gate of death and out of the mouth of hell to the imagined Eden of America. To many of those who went, it was harder to go than to stay there on the vessel, gaping with its mortal wounds and ready to go down. It meant that tossing on the waters, they must wait in suspense, hour after hour, even after the lights of the ship were engulfed in appalling darkness, hoping against hope for the miracle of a rescue dearer to them than their own lives. It was the tradition of Anglo-Saxon heroism that was fulfilled in the frozen seas during the black hours of Sunday night. The heroism was that of the women who went, as well as of the men who remained. End of chapter 6 of Sinking of the Titanic in Great Sea Disasters Read by Allison Hester Chapter 7 of Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 7 Left to Their Fate coolness and heroism of those left to perish suicide of murdoch captain smith's end the ship's band plays a noble hymn as the vessel goes down the general feeling aboard the ship after the boats had left her sides was that she would not survive her wound but the passengers who remained aboard displayed the utmost heroism William T. Steed, the famous English journalist, was so little alarmed that he calmly discussed with one of the passengers the probable height of the iceberg after the Titanic had shot into it. Confidence in the ability of the Titanic to remain afloat doubtlessly led many of the passengers to death. The theory that the great ship was unsinkable remained with hundreds who had entrusted themselves to the gigantic hulk, long after the officers knew that the vessel could not survive. The captain and officers behaved with superb gallantry, and there was perfect order and discipline among those who were aboard, even after all hope had been abandoned for the salvation of the ship. Many women went down, steerage women, who were unable to get to the upper decks where the boats were launched, maids who were overlooked in the confusion, cabin passengers who refused to desert their husbands, or who had reached the decks after the last of the lifeboats was gone and the ship was settling for her final plunge to the bottom of the Atlantic. Narratives of survivors do not bear out the supposition that the final hours upon the vessel's decks were passed in darkness. They say the electric lighting plant held out until the last, and that even as they watched the ship sink from their places in the floating lifeboats, her lights were gleaming in long rows as she plunged under by the head. Just before she sank, some of the refugees say, the ship broke in two abaft the engine room after the bulkhead explosions had occurred. Colonel Astor's Death To Colonel Astor's death, Philip Mock bears this testimony. Many men were hanging on to rafts in the sea. 
William T. Steed and Colonel Astor were among them. Their feet and hands froze and they had to let go. Both were drowned. The last man among the survivors to speak to Colonel Astor was K. Whiteman, the ship's barber. I shaved Colonel Astor Sunday afternoon, said Whiteman. He was a pleasant, affable man, and that awful night when I found myself standing beside him on the passenger deck, helping him to put the women into boats, I spoke to him. Where is your life belt? I asked him. I didn't think there would be any need of it, he said. Get one while there is time, I told him. The last boat is gone and we are done for. No, he said. I think there are some lifeboats to be launched, and we may get on one of them. There are no life rafts, I told him, and the ship is going to sink. I am going to jump overboard and take a chance on swimming out and being picked up by one of the boats. Better come along. No, thank you, he said calmly. I think I'll have to stick. I asked him if he would mind shaking hands with me. He said, with pleasure, gave me a hearty grip, and then I climbed up on the rail and jumped overboard. I was in the water for nearly four hours before one of the boats picked me up. Captain washed overboard. Murdoch's last orders were to Quartermaster Moody and a few other petty officers who had taken their places in the rigid discipline of the ship and were lowering the boats. Captain Smith came up to him on the bridge several times and then rushed down again. They spoke to one another only in monosyllables. There were stories that Captain Smith, when he saw the ship actually going down, had committed suicide. There is no basis for such tales. The captain, according to the testimony of those who were near him almost until the last, was admirably cool. He carried a revolver in his hand, ready to use it on anyone who disobeyed orders. I want every man to act like a man for manhood's sake, he said, and if they don't, a bullet awaits the coward. With the revolver in his hand, a fact that undoubtedly gave rise to the suicide theory, the captain moved up and down the deck. He gave the order for each lifeboat to make off, and he remained until every boat was gone. Standing on the bridge, he finally called out the order, Each man save himself! At that moment, all discipline fled. It was the last call of death. If there had been any hope among those on board before, the hope had now fled. The bearded admiral of the White Star Line fleet, with every life-saving device launched from the decks, was returning to the deck to perform the sacred office of going down with his ship when a wave dashed over the side and tore him from the ladder. The Titanic was sinking rapidly by the head, with the twisting, sidelong motion that was soon to aim her on her course two miles down. Murdoch saw the skipper swept out, but did not move. Captain Smith was but one of a multitude of lost at that moment. Murdoch may have known that the last desperate thought of the Grey Mariner was to get up upon his bridge and die in command. That the old man could not have done this may have had something to do with Murdoch's suicidal inspiration. Of that, no man may say or safely guess. The wave that swept the skipper out bore him almost to the thwart of a crowded lifeboat. Hands reached out, but he wrenched himself away, turned, and swam back toward the ship. Some say that he said, Goodbye, I'm going back to the ship. He disappeared for a moment, then reappeared where a rail was slipping underwater, cool and courageous to the end loyal to his duty under the most difficult circumstances he showed himself a noble captain and he died a noble death saw both officers perish quartermaster moody saw all this watched the skipper scramble aboard onto his submerged deck and then vanish altogether in a great billow as moody's eye lost sight of the skipper in this confusion of waters it again shifted to the bridge and just in time to see Murdoch take his life. The man's face was turned toward him, Moody said, and he could not mistake it. There were still many gleaming lights on the ship, flickering out like little groups of vanishing stars, and with the clear starshine on the waters, there was nothing to cloud or break the quartermaster's vision. I saw Murdoch die by his own hand, said Moody, saw the flash from his gun, heard the crack that followed the flash, and then saw him plunge over on his face. Others report hearing several pistol shots on the decks below the bridge, 
but amid the groans and shrieks and cries shouted orders and all that vast orchestra of sounds that broke upon the air they must have been faint periods of punctuation band played its own dirge the band had broken out in the strains of nearer my god to thee some minutes before murdoch lifted the revolver to his head fired and toppled over on his face Moody saw all this in a vision that filled his brain, while his ears drank in the tragic strain of the beautiful hymn that the band played as their own dirge, even to the moment when the waters sucked them down. Wherever Murdoch's eye swept the water in that instant, before he drew his revolver, it looked upon veritable seas of drowning men and women. From the decks there came to him the shrieks and groans of the caged and drowning, for whom all hope of escape was utterly vanished. He evidently never gave a thought to the possibility of saving himself, his mind freezing with the horrors he beheld, and having room for just one central idea, swift extinction. The strains of the hymn and the frantic cries of the dying blended in a symphony of sorrow. Led by the green light, under the light of the stars, the boat drew away, and the bow, then the quarter, then the stacks, and last the stern of the marble ship, of a few days before passed beneath the waters the great force of the ship's sinking was unaided by any violence of the elements and the suction not so great as had been feared rocked but mildly the group of boats now a quarter of a mile distant from it just before the titanic disappeared from view men and women leaped from the stern more than a hundred men according to colonel gracie jumped at the last Gracie was among the number, and he and the second officer were of the very few who were saved. As the vessel disappeared, the waves drowned the majestic hymn which the musicians played as they went to their watery grave. The most authentic accounts agree that this hymn was not Nearer My God to Thee, which it seems had been played shortly before, but Autumn, which is found in the Episcopal Hymnal, and which fits appropriately the situation on the Titanic, in the last moments of pain and darkness there. One line, Hold me up in mighty waters, particularly may have suggested the hymn to some minister aboard the doomed vessel, who, it has been thought, thereupon, asked the remaining passengers to join in singing the hymn, in a last service aboard the sinking ship, soon to be ended by death itself. Following is the hymn. God of mercy and compassion, look with pity on my pain, Hear a mournful broken spirit, prostrate at thy feet complain. Many are my foes and mighty, strength to conquer I have none. Nothing can uphold my goings, but thy blessed self alone. Savior, look on thy beloved, triumph over all my foes. Turn to heavenly joy my mourning, turn to gladness all my woes. Live or die, or work or suffer, let my weary soul abide. In all changes whatsoever, sure and steadfast by thy side. When temptations fierce assault me, when my enemies I find, sin and guilt and death and Satan, all against my soul combined, hold me up in mighty waters, keep my eyes on things above, righteousness, divine atonement, peace and everlasting love. It was a little lame schoolmaster, Tertius, who aroused the Spartans by his poetry and led them to victory against the foe. It was the musicians of the band of the Titanic, poor men, paid a few dollars a week, who played the music to keep up the courage of the souls aboard the sinking ship. The way the band kept playing was a noble thing, says the wireless operator. I heard it first while we were working the wireless, when there was a ragtime tune for us and the last I saw of the band, when I was floating, struggling in the icy water, it was still on deck, playing autumn. How those brave fellows ever did it, I cannot imagine. Perhaps that music, made in the face of death, would not have satisfied the exacting critical sense. It may be that the chilled fingers faltered on the pistons of the cornet, or at the valves of the French horn, that the time was irregular, and that by an organ in a church, with a decorous congregation, the hymns they chose would have been better played and sung. But surely that music went up to God from the souls of drowning men, and was not less acceptable than the song of songs no mortal ear may hear, 
the harps of the seraphs and the choiring cherubim under the sea the music makers lie still in their fingers clutching the broken and battered means of melody but over the strident voice of whirring winds and the sound of many waters there rises their chant eternally and though the musicians lie hushed and cold at the sea's heart their music is heard forevermore last moments that great ship which started out as proudly went down to her death like some grime silent juggernaut drunk with carnage and anxious to stop the throbbing of her own heart at the bottom of the sea charles h lightoller second officer of the titanic tells the story this way i stuck to the ship until the water came up to my ankles there had been no lamentations no demonstrations either from the men passengers as they saw the last lifeboat go and there was no wailing or crying no outburst from the men who lined the ship's rail as the titanic disappeared from sight the men stood quietly as if they were in church they knew that they were in the sight of god that in a moment judgment would be passed upon them finally the ship took a dive reeling for a moment then plunging i was sucked to the side of the ship against the grating over the blower for the exhaust there was an explosion it blew me to the surface again only to be sucked back again by the water rushing into the ship this time i landed against the grating over the pipes which furnish a draught for the funnels and stuck there then there was another explosion and i came to the surface the ship seemed to be heaving tremendous sighs as she went down i found myself not many feet from the ship but on the other side of it the ship had turned around while i was under the water i came up near a collapsible lifeboat and grabbed it many men were in the water with me they had jumped at the last minute a funnel fell within four inches of me and killed one of the swimmers thirty clung to the capsized boat and a lifeboat with forty survivors in it already finally took them off george d widener and harry elkins widener were among those who jumped at the last minute so did robert williams daniel the three of them went down together daniel struck out lashing the water with his arms until he had made a point far distant from the sinking monster of the sea later he was picked up by one of the passing lifeboats the Wideners were not seen again, nor was John B. Thayer, who went down on the boat. Jack Thayer, who was literally thrown off the Titanic by an explosion, after he had refused to leave the men to go with his mother, floated around on a raft for an hour before he was picked up. A Float with Jack Thayer Graphic accounts of the final plunge of the Titanic were related by two Englishmen, survivors by the merest chance. One of them struggled for hours to hold himself afloat on an overturned collapsible lifeboat, to one end of which John B. Thayer, Jr. of Philadelphia, whose father perished, hung until rescued. The men gave their names as A. H. Barkworth, Justice of the Peace of East Riding, Yorkshire, England, and W. J. Mellers of Christ Church Terrace, Chelsea, London. The latter, a young man, had started for this country with his savings to seek his fortune and had lost all but his life mellers like quartermaster moody said captain smith did not commit suicide the captain jumped from the bridge mellers declares and he heard him say to his officers and crew you have done your duty boys now every man for himself mellers and barkworth who say their names have been spelled incorrectly in most of the lists of survivors both declare that there were three distinct explosions before the Titanic broke in two, and bow section first, and stern part last, settled with her human cargo into the sea. Her four whistles kept up a deafening blast until the explosions, declare the men. The death cries from the shrill throats of the blatant steam screechers beside the smokestacks so rent the air that conversation among the passengers was possible only when one yelled into the ear of a fellow unfortunate. I did not know the Thayer family well, declared Mr. Barkworth, but I had met young Thayer, a clear-cut chap, and his father on the trip. The lad and I struggled in the water for several hours, endeavoring to hold afloat by grabbing to the sides and end of an overturned lifeboat. Now and again, we lost our grip and fell back into the water. 
I did not recognize young Thayer in the darkness, as we struggled for our lives, but I did recall having met him before when we were picked up by a lifeboat. We were saved by the merest chance, because the survivors on a lifeboat that rescued us hesitated in doing so, it seemed, fearing perhaps that additional burdens would swamp the frail craft. I considered my fur overcoat helped to keep me afloat. I had a life preserver over it, under my arms, but it would not have held me up so well out of the water but for the coat. The fur of the coat seemed not to get wet through, and retained a certain amount of air that added to buoyance. I shall never part with it. The testimony of J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line, that he had not heard explosions before the Titanic settled, indicates that he must have gotten some distance from her in his lifeboat. There were three distinct explosions, and the ship broke in the center. The bow settled headlong first, and the stern last. I was looking toward her from the raft, to which young Thayer and I had clung. How Captain Smith Died Barkworth jumped just before the Titanic went down. He said there were enough life preservers for all the passengers, but in the confusion many may not have known where to look for them. Mellers, who had donned a life preserver, was hurled into the air from the bow of the ship by the force of the explosion which he believed caused the Titanic to part in the center. I was not far from where Captain Smith stood on the bridge, giving full orders to his men, said Mellers. The brave old seaman was crying, but he had stuck heroically to the last. He did not shoot himself. He jumped from the bridge when he had done all he could. I heard his final instructions to his crew and recall that his last words were, you have done your duty, boys, now every man for himself. I thought I was doomed to go down with the rest. I stood on the deck, awaiting my fate, fearing to jump from the ship. Then came a grinding noise, followed by two others, and I was hurled into the deep. Great waves engulfed me, but I was not drawn toward the ship, so that I believed there was little suction. I swam about for more than an hour before I was picked up by a boat. A FATEFUL OFFICER Charles Herbert Lightoller, previously mentioned, stood by the ship until the last, working to get the passengers away. And when it appeared he had made his last trip, he went up high on the officer's quarters and made the best dive he knew how to make just as the ship plunged down to the depths. This is an excerpt from his testimony before the Senate Investigating Committee. What time did you leave the ship? I didn't leave it. Did it leave you? Yes, sir. Children shall hear that episode sung in after years, and his own descendants shall recite it to their barns. Mr. Lightoller acted as an officer and a gentleman should, and he was not the only one. A message from a notorious gambler. That J. Yates, gambler, confidence man and fugitive from justice, known to the police and in sporting circles as J. H. Rogers, went down with the Titanic after assisting many women aboard lifeboats, became known when a note, written on a blank page torn from a diary, was delivered to his sister. Here is a facsimile of the note. This note was given by Rogers to a woman he was helping into a lifeboat. The woman, who signed herself Survivor, enclosed the note with the following letter. You will find note that was handed to me as I was leaving the Titanic. I am stranger to this man, but I think he was a card player. He helped me aboard a lifeboat, and I saw him, saw him help others. Before we were lowered, I saw him jump into the sea. If picked up, I did not recognize him on the Carpathia. I don't think he was registered on the ship under his right name. Roger's mother, Mrs. Mary A. Yates, an old woman, broke down when she learned her son had perished. Thank God I know where he is now, she sobbed. I have not heard from him in two years. The last news I had from him, he was in London. Fifty Lads Met Death Among the many hundreds of heroic souls who went bravely and quietly to their end were fifty happy-go-lucky youngsters, shipped as bellboys or messengers to serve the first cabin passengers. 
James Humphreys, a quartermaster who commanded lifeboat number 11, told a little story that shows how these 50 lads met death. Humphreys said the boys were called to their regular posts in the main cabin entry and taken in charge by their captain, a steward. They were ordered to remain in the cabin and not to get in the way. Throughout the first hour of confusion and terror, these lads sat quietly on their benches in various parts of the first cabin. Then, just toward the end when the order was passed round that the ship was going down and every man was free to save himself, if he kept away from the lifeboats in which the women were being taken, the bellboys scattered to all parts of the ship. Humphrey said he saw numbers of them smoking cigarettes and joking with the passengers. They seemed to think that their violation of the rule against smoking while on duty was a sufficient breach of discipline. Not one of them attempted to enter a lifeboat. Not one of them was saved. The Heroes Who Remained The women who left the ship, the men who remained, there is little to choose between them for heroism. Many of the women compelled to take to the boats would have stayed, had it been possible, to share the fate of their nearest and dearest, without whom their lives are crippled, broken, and disconsolate. The heroes who remained would have said, with Greenville, We have only done our duty, as a man is bound to do. They sought no palms or crowns of martyrdom. They also serve who only stand and wait and their first action was merely to step aside and give places in the boats to women and children, some of whom were too young to comprehend or to remember. There was no debate as to whether the life of a financier, a master of business, was rated higher in the scale of values than that of an ignorant peasant mother. A woman was a woman, whether she wore rags or pearls. A life was given for a life with no assertion that one was priceless and the other comparatively valueless. Many of those who elected to remain might have escaped. Chivalry is a mild appellation for their conduct. Some of the vaunted knights of old were desperate cowards by comparison. A fight in the open field or jousting in the tournament did not call out the manhood in a man as did the waiting till the great ship took the final plunge in the knowledge that the seas round were covered with loving and yearning witnesses whose own salvation was not assured when the roll is called hereafter of those who are purged of pride because they died who know the worth of their days let the names of the men who went down with the titanic be found written there in the sight of god and men the obvious lesson and, whatever view of the accident be taken, whether the moralist shall use it to point the text of a solemn or denunciatory warning, or whether the materialist, swinging to the other extreme, scouts any other theory than that of the fortuitous concurrence of atoms, there is scarcely a thinking mortal who has heard of what happened who has not been deeply stirred, in the sense of personal bereavement, to a profound humility and the conviction of his own insignificance in the greater universal scheme. Many there are whom the influences of religion do not move, and upon whose hearts are most generous sentiments knock in vain, who still are overawed and bowed by the magnitude of this catastrophe. No matter what they believe about it, the effect is the same. The effect is to reduce a man from the swaggering braggart the vainglorious lord of what he sees, the self-made master of his fate, of nature, of time, of space, of everything, to his true microscopic stature in the cosmos. He goes in tears to put together, again, the fragments of the few, small, pitiful things that belong to him. Though love may pine and reason chafe, there came a voice without reply. The only comfort all that can bring surcease of sorrow is that men fashioned in the image of their maker rose to the emergency like heroes and went to their grave as bravely as any who have given their lives at any time in war the hearts of those who waited on the land and agonized were impotent to save have been laid upon the same altars of sacrifice the mourning of those who will not be comforted rises from alien lands together with our own in a common broken intercession 
how little is the 882 feet of the monster that we have launched compared with the arc of the rainbow we can see even in our grief spanning the frozen boreal mist the best of what we do and are just god forgave the ancient sacrifice and still our work must go on it is the business of men and women neither to give way to unavailing grief nor to yield to the crushing incubus of despair but to find hope that is at the bottom of everything even at the bottom of the sea where that glorious virgin of the ocean is dying and when she took it unto herself a mate she must espouse the everlasting sea even so for any progress of the race there must be the ancient sacrifice of man's own stubborn heart in all his pride. He must forever lay in dust life's glory dead. He cannot rise to the height it was intended he should reach till he has plumbed the depths, till he has devoured the bread of the bitterest affliction, till he has known the ache of hopes deferred, of anxious expectation disappointed, of dreams that are not to be fulfilled this side of the river that waters the meads of paradise there still must be a reason why it is not an unhappy thing to be taken from the world we know to one a wonder still and so that we go bravely what does it matter the mode of our going it was not only those who stood back who let the women and children go to the boats that died there died among us on the shore something of the fierce greed of bitterness something of the sharp hatred of passion something of the mad lust of revenge and of knife-edge competition though we are not aware of it perhaps we are not quite the people that we were before out of the mystery an awful hand was laid upon us all and what we had thought the colossal power of wealth was in a twinkling shown to be no more than the strength of an infant's little finger or the twining tendril of a plant lest we forget lest we forget the agony and despair which possessed the occupants of these boats as they were carried away from the doomed giant leaving husbands and brothers behind is almost beyond description it is little wonder that the strain of these moments with the physical and mental suffering which followed during the early morning hours left many of the women still hysterical when they reached new york where manhood perished not where cross the lines of forty north and fifty fourteen west there rolls a wild and greedy sea with death upon its crest no stone or wreath from human hands will ever mark the spot where fifteen hundred men went down but manhood perished not old ocean takes but little heed of human tears or woe no shafts adorn the ocean graves nor weeping willows grow nor is there need of marble slab to keep in mind the spot where noble men went down to death but manhood perished not those men who looked on death and smiled and trod the crumbling deck have saved much more than precious lives from out that awful wreck though countless joys and hopes and fears were shattered at a breath tis something that the name of man did not go down to death tis not an easy thing to die even in the open air twelve hundred miles from home and friends in a shroud of black despair a wreath to crown the brow of man and hide a former blot will ever blossom o'er the waves where manhood perished not harvey p few end of chapter seven of the sinking of the titanic and great sea disasters Chapters 8 and 9 of The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 8. The Call for Help Heard. The value of the wireless, other ships alter their course, rescuers on the way. We have struck an iceberg, badly damaged, rush aid. 
Steward and landward, J. G. Phillips, the Titanic's wireless man, had hurled the appeal for help. By fits and starts, for the wireless was working unevenly and blurringly, Phillips reached out to the world, crying the Titanic's peril. A word or two, scattered phrases, now and then a connected sentence, made up the message that sent a thrill of apprehension for a thousand miles east, west, and south of the doomed liner. The early despatches from St. John's, Cape Race, and Montreal told graphic tales of the race to reach the Titanic, the wireless appeals for help, the interruption of the calls, then what appeared to be a successful conclusion of the race when the Virginian was reported as having reached the giant liner. Many lines hear the call. Other rushing liners besides the Virginian heard the call and became on the instant something more than cargo carriers and passenger greyhounds. The big Baltic, 200 miles to the eastward and westbound, turned again to save life, as she did when her sister of the White Star Fleet, the Republic, was cut down in a fog in January 1909. The Titanic's mate, the Olympic, the mightiest of the seagoers, save the Titanic herself, turned in her tracks. All along the northern lane, the miracle of the wireless worked for the distressed and sinking White Star ship. The Hamburg American Cincinnati, the Parisian from Glasgow, the North German Lloyd Prince Frederick Wilhelm, the Hamburg American liners Prince Adalbert and America, all heard the CQD and the rapid, condensed explanation of what had happened. Virginian in desperate haste. But the Virginian was nearest barely 170 miles away, and was the first to know of the Titanic's danger. She went about and headed under forced drought for the spot indicated in one of the last of Phillips' messages, latitude 41.46 north and longitude 50.14 west. She is a fast ship, the Allen Liner, and her wireless has told the story of how she stretched through the night to get up to the Titanic in time, there was need for all the power of her engines and all the experience and skill of her captain. The final fluttering marconograms that were released from the Titanic made it certain that the great ship with 2,340 souls aboard was filling and in desperate peril. Further out at sea was the Cunarder, Carpathia, which left New York for the Mediterranean on April 13th. Round she went and plunged back westward to take a hand in saving life. And the third steamship, within short sailing of the Titanic, was the Allen Liner Parisian, away to the eastward, on her way from Glasgow to Halifax. While they sped in the night with all the drive that steam could give them, the Titanic's call reached to Cape Race and startled the operator there, heard at midnight a message which quickly reached New York have struck an iceberg. We are badly damaged. Titanic latitude 41.46 north, 50.14 west. Cape Race threw the appeal broadcast wherever his apparatus could carry. Then for hours, while the world waited for a crumb of news as to the safety of the great ship's people, not one thing more was known save that she was drifting, brokeous and helpless, and alone in the midst of a waste of ice and it was not until 17 hours after the Titanic had sunk that the words came out of the air as to her fate. There was a confusion and tangle of messages, a jumble of rumors. Good tidings were trodden upon by evil, and no man knew clearly what was taking place in that stretch of waters where the giant icebergs were making a mock of all that the world knew best in shipbuilding. Titanic sent out no more news. It was at 12.17 a.m., while the Virginian was still plunging eastward, that all communication from the Titanic ceased. The Virginian's operator, with the Virginian's captain at his elbow, fed the air with blue flashes in a desperate effort to know what was happening to the crippled liner, but no message came back. The last word from the Titanic was that she was sinking. Then the sparking became fainter. The call was dying to nothing. The Virginian's operator labored over a blur of signals. It was hopeless, so the Allen ship strove on, fearing that the worst had happened. 
It was this ominous silence that so alarmed the other vessels hurrying to the Titanic and that caused so much suspense here. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 In the Drifting Lifeboats Sorrow and Suffering the survivors see the Titanic go down with their loved ones on board. A night of agonizing suspense. Women help to row. Help arrives. Picking up the lifeboats. Sixteen boats were in the procession which entered on the terrible hours of rowing, drifting, and suspense. Women wept for lost husbands and sons. Sailors sobbed for the ship which had been their pride. Men choked back tears and sought to comfort the widowed. Perhaps, they said, other boats might have put off in another direction. They strove, though none too sure themselves, to convince the women of the certainty that a rescue ship would appear. In the distance, the Titanic looked an enormous length, her great bulk outlined in black against the starry sky, every porthole and saloon blazing with light. It was impossible to think anything could be wrong with such a leviathan, were it not for the ominous tilt downward in the bows, where the water was now up to the lowest row of portholes. Presently, about 2 a.m., as near as can be determined, those in the lifeboats observed her settling very rapidly, with the bows and the bridge completely under water, and concluded it was now only a question of minutes before she went. So it proved she slowly tilted straight on end with the stern vertically upwards and as she did the lights in the cabins and saloons which until then had not flickered for a moment died out came on again for a single flash and finally went all together at the same time the machinery roared down through the vessel with a rattle and a groaning that could be heard for miles the weirdest sound surely that could be heard in the middle of the ocean a thousand miles away from land but this was not yet quite the end titanic stood upright to the amazement of the awed watchers in the lifeboats the doomed vessel remained in that upright position for a time estimated at five minutes. Some in the boat say less, but it was certainly some minutes that at least 150 feet of the Titanic towered up above the level of the sea and loomed black against the sky. Saw last a big ship. Then, with a quiet, slanting dive, she disappeared beneath the waters and the eyes of the helpless spectators had looked for the last time upon the gigantic vessel on which they had set out from Southampton. And there was left to the survivors only the gently heaving sea, the lifeboats filled with men and women in every conceivable condition of dress and undress, above the perfect sky of brilliant stars with not a cloud, all tempered with a bitter cold that made each man and woman long to be one of the crew who toiled away with the oars and kept themselves warm thereby. A curious deadening, bitter cold unlike anything they had felt before. One long moan. And then with all these there fell on the ear the most appalling noise that a human being has ever listened to. The cries of hundreds of fellow beings struggling in the icy cold water, crying out for help with a cry that could not be answered. Third officer Herbert John Pittman, in charge of one of the boats, described this cry of agony in his testimony before the Senatorial Investigating Committee under the questioning of Senator Smith. I heard no cries of distress until after the ship went down, he said. How far away were the cries from your lifeboat? Several hundred yards, probably, some of them. Describe the screams. Don't, sir, please. I'd rather not talk about it. I'm sorry to press it, but what was it like? Were the screams spasmodic? It was one long, continuous moan. The witness said the moans and cries continued an hour. Those in the lifeboats longed to return and pick up some of the poor drowning souls, but they feared this would mean swamping the boats and a further loss of life. Some of the men tried to sing to keep the women from hearing the cries and rowed hard to get away from the scene of the wreck. But the memory of those sounds will be one of the things the rescued will find it hard to forget. 
the waiting sufferers kept a lookout for lights and several times it was shouted that steamers lights were seen but they turned out to either be a light from another boat or a star low down on the horizon it was hard to keep up hope women tried to commit suicide let me go back i want to go back to my husband i'll jump from the boat if you don't cried an agonized voice in one lifeboat you can do no good by going back other lives will be lost if you try it try to calm yourself for the sake of the living it may be that your husband will be picked up somewhere by one of the fishing boats the woman who pleaded to go back according to mrs vera dick of calgary canada later tried to throw herself from the lifeboat mrs dick describing the scenes in the lifeboats said there were half a dozen women in that one boat who tried to commit suicide when they realized that the titanic had gone down even in canada where we have such clear nights said mrs dick i have never seen such a clear sky the stars were very bright and we could see the titanic plainly like a great hotel on the water floor after floor of the lights went out as we watched it was horrible horrible i can't bear to think about it from the distance as we rode away we could hear the band playing nearer my god to thee among the lifeboats themselves however there were scenes just as terrible perhaps but to me nothing could outdo the tragic grandeur with which the titanic went to its death to realize it you would have to see the titanic as i saw it the day we set sail with the flags flying and the band playing everybody on board was laughing and talking about the titanic being the biggest and most luxurious boat on the ocean and being unsinkable to think of it then and to think of it standing out there in the night wounded to death and gasping for life is almost too big for the imagination scantily clad women in lifeboats the women on our boat were in nightgowns and bare feet some of them and the wealthiest women mingled with the poorest immigrants one immigrant woman kept shouting my god my poor father he put me in this boat and would not save himself oh why didn't i die why didn't i die why can't i die now we had to restrain her else she would have jumped overboard it was simply awful some of the men apparently had said they could row just to get into the boats we paid no attention to cowardice however we were all busy with our own troubles my heart simply bled for the women who were separated from their husbands the night was frightfully cold although clear we had to huddle together to keep warm everybody drank sparingly of the water and ate sparingly of the bread we did not know when we would be saved everybody tried to remain cool except the poor creatures who could think of nothing but their own great loss those with the most brains seemed to control themselves best philadelphia women heroines how mrs george d widener whose husband and son perished after kissing her goodbye and helping her into one of the boats rowed when exhausted seamen were on the verge of collapse was told by emily geiger maid of mrs widener who was saved with her the girl said mrs widener bravely toiled throughout the night and consoled other women who had broken down under the strain mrs william e carter and mrs john b thayer were in the same lifeboat and worked heroically to keep it free from the icy menace although mrs thayer's husband remained aboard the titanic and sank with it and although she had no knowledge of the safety of her son until they met hours later aboard the carpathia mrs thayer bravely labored at the oars throughout the night in telling of her experience mrs carter said when i went over the side with my children and got in the boat there were no seamen in it then came a few men but there were oars with no one to use them the boat had been filled with passengers and there was nothing else for me to do but take an oar we could see now that the time of the ship had come she was sinking and we were warned by cries from the men above to pull away from the ship quickly mrs thayer wife of the vice president of the pennsylvania railroad was in my boat and she too took an oar it was cold and we had no time to clothe ourselves with warm overcoats the rowing warmed me we started to pull away from the ship we could see the dim outlines of the decks above but we could not recognize anybody 
Many Women Rowing Mrs. William R. Bucknell's account of the part women played in the rowing is as follows. There were thirty-five persons in the boat in which the captain placed me. Three of these were ordinary seamen, supposed to manage the boat, and a steward. One of these men seemed to think that we should not start away from the sinking ship until it could be learned whether the other boats would accommodate the rest of the women. He seemed to think that more could be crowded into hours if necessary. I would rather go back and go down with the ship than leave under these circumstances, he cried. The captain shouted to him to obey orders and pull for a little light that could just be discerned miles in the distance. I do not know what this little light was. It may have been a passing fishing vessel, which of course could not know our predicament. Anyway, we never reached it. We rowed all night. I took an oar and sat beside the Countess de Rolts. Her maid had an oar and so did mine. The air was freezing cold, and it was not long before the only man that appeared to know anything about rowing commenced to complain that his hands were freezing. A woman back of him handed him a shawl from about her shoulders. As we rowed, we looked back at the lights of the Titanic. There was not a sound from her. Only the lights began to get lower and lower, and finally she sank. Then we heard a muffled explosion and a dull roar caused by the great suction of water. There was not a drop of water on our boat. The last minute before our boat was launched, Captain Smith threw aboard a bag of bread. I took the precaution of taking a good drink of water before we started, so I suffered no inconvenience from thirst. Mrs. Lucian Smith, whose husband perished, was another heroine. It is related by survivors that she took turns at the oars, and then, when the boat was in danger of sinking, stood ready to plug the hole with her finger if the cork stopper became loose. In another boat, Mrs. Cornell and her sister, who had a slight knowledge of rowing, took turns at the oar, as did other women. The boat in which Mrs. J. J. Brown of Denver, Colorado, was saved contained only three men in all, and only one rowed. He was a half-frozen seaman who was tumbled into the boat at the last minute. The woman wrapped him in blankets and set him at an oar to start his blood. The second man was too old to be of any use. The third was a coward. Strange to say, there was room in this boat for ten other people. Ten brave men would have received the warmest welcome of their lives if they had been there. The coward, being a quartermaster and the assigned head of the boat, sat in the stern and steered. He was terrified, and the women had to fight against his pessimism while they tugged at the oars. The women sat two at each oar. One held the oar in place, and the other did the pulling. Mrs. Brown coached them and cheered them on. She told them that the exercise would keep the chill out of their veins, and she spoke, hopefully, of the likelihood that some vessel would answer the wireless calls. Over the frightful danger of the situation, the spirit of this woman soared. The Pessimist And the coward sat in his stern seat, terrified, his tongue loosened with fright. He assured them there was no chance in the world. He had had fourteen years' experience, and he knew. First, they would have to row one and a half miles at least to get out of the sphere of suction if they did not want to go down. They would be lost, and nobody would ever find them. Oh, we shall be picked up sooner or later, said some of the braver ones. No, said the man. There was no bread in the boat, no water. They would all starve. All that big boatload wandering the high seas with nothing to eat, perhaps for days. Don't, cried Mrs. Brown. Keep that to yourself if you feel that way. For the sake of these women and children, be a man. We have a smooth sea and a fighting chance. Be a man. But the coward only knew that there was no compass and no chart aboard. They sighted what they thought was a fishing smack on the horizon, showing dimly in the early dawn. The man at the rudder steered toward it, and the women bent to their oars again. They covered several miles in this way, but the smack faded into the distance. They could not see it any longer, and the coward said that everything was over. They rowed back nine weary miles. Then the coward thought they must stop rowing and lie in the trough of the waves until the Carpathia should appear. The women tried it for a few moments and felt the cold creeping into their bodies. 
Though exhausted from the hard physical labor, they thought work was better than freezing. "'Row again!' commanded Mrs. Brown. "'No, no, don't!' said the coward. "'We shall freeze!' cried several of the women together. "'We must row! We have rowed all this time! We must keep on or freeze!' When the coward still demurred, they told him plainly and once for all that if he persisted in wanting them to stop rowing, they were going to throw him overboard and be done with him for good. Something about the look in the eye of that Mississippi-bred oars woman, who seemed such a force among her fellows, told him that he had better capitulate. And he did. Countess Rhodes, an expert oarsman. Miss Alice Farnham Leader, a New York physician, escaped from the Titanic on the boat which carried the Countess Rhodes. The Countess is an expert oarswoman, said Dr. Leader, and thoroughly at home on the water. She practically took command of our boat when it was found that the seamen who had been placed at the oars could not row skillfully. Several of the women took their place with the Countess at the oars and rowed in turns, while the weak and unskilled stewards sat quietly in one end of the boat. Men could not row. With nothing on but a nightgown, I helped row one of the boats for three hours, said Miss Florence Ware of Bristol, England. In our boat, there were a lot of women, a steward, and a fireman. None of the men knew anything about managing a small boat, so some of the women who were used to boats took charge. It was cold, and I worked as hard as I could at an oar until we were picked up. There was nothing to eat or drink on our boat. Deaths on the lifeboats. The temperature must have been below freezing, testified another survivor, and neither men nor women in my boat were warmly clothed. Several of them died. The officer in charge of the lifeboat decided it was better to bury the bodies. Soon they were weighted so they would sink and were put overboard. We could also see similar burials taking place from other lifeboats that were all around us. Gamblers were polite. In one boat were two card sharps. With the same cleverness that enabled them to win money on board, they obtained places in the boats with the women. In the boat with the gamblers were women in their nightgowns and women in evening dress. None of the boats were properly equipped with food but all had enough bread and water to keep the rescued from starving until the expected arrival of help. To the credit of the gamblers who managed to escape, it should be said that they were polite and showed the women every courtesy. All they wanted was to be sure of getting in a boat. That, once accomplished, they reverted to their habitual practice of politeness and suavity. They were even willing to do a little manual labor, refusing to let women do any rowing. The people on that particular boat were a sad group. Fathers had kissed their daughters goodbye, and husbands had parted from their wives. The card sharps, however, philosophized wonderfully about the will of the Almighty and how strange his ways. They said that one must be prepared for anything, that good always comes from evil, and that every cloud has a silver lining. Who knows, said one, it may be that everybody on board will be saved. Another added, our duty is to the living. You women owe it to your relatives and friends not to allow this thing to wreck your reason or undermine your health. And they took pains to see that all the women who were on the lifeboat had plenty of covering to keep them from the icy blasts of the night. Help in Sight The survivors were in the lifeboats until about 5.30 a.m., about 3 a.m., faint lights appeared in the sky, and all rejoiced to see what was supposed to be the coming dawn, but after watching for a half an hour and seeing no change in the intensity of light, the disappointed sufferers realized it was the northern lights. Presently, low down on the horizon, they saw a light, which slowly resolved itself into a double light, and they watched eagerly to see if the two lights would separate, and so proved to be only two of the boats or whether these lights would remain together, in which case they should expect them to be the lights of a rescuing steamer. To the inexpressible joy of all, they moved as one. Immediately the boats were swung around and headed for the lights. Someone shouted, Now boys sing! And everyone not too weak broke into song with, 
Row for the shore, boys. Tears came to the eyes of all as they realized that safety was at hand. The song was sung, but it was a very poor imitation of the real thing, for quavering voices make poor songs. A cheer was given next, and that was better. You can keep in tune for a cheer. The Lucky Thirteen our rescuer showed up rapidly, and as she swung round we saw her cabins all alight, and we knew she must be a large steamer. She was now motionless, and we had to row to her. Just then day broke, a beautiful quiet dawn with faint pink clouds just above the horizon, and a new moon whose crescent just touched the horizon. "'Turn your money over, boys,' said our cheery steersman. "'That is, if you have any with you,' he added." We laughed at him for his superstition at such a time, but he countered very neatly by adding, Well, I shall never say again that 13 is an unlucky number. Boat 13 has been the best friend we ever had. Certainly, the 13 superstition is killed forever in the minds of those who escaped from the Titanic in Boat 13. As we neared the Carpathia, we saw in the dawning light what we thought was a full-rigged schooner standing up near her, and presently behind her another, all sails set, and we said, They are fisher boats from the Newfoundland bank, and have seen the steamer lying to and are standing by to help. But in another five minutes, the light shone pink on them, and we saw they were icebergs towering many feet in the air, huge, glistening masses, deadly white steel and peeked in a way that had easily suggested a schooner we glanced round the horizon and there were others wherever the eye could reach the steamer we had to reach was surrounded by them and we had to make a detour to reach her for between her and us lay another huge berg a wonderful dawn Speaking of the moment when the Carpathia was sighted, Mrs. J. J. Brown, who had cowed the driveling quartermaster, said, Then knowing that we were safe at last, I looked about me. The most wonderful dawn I have ever seen came upon us. I have just returned from Egypt. I have been all over the world, but I have never seen anything like this. First the gray, and then the flood of light. Then the sun came up in a ball of red fire. For the first time we saw where we were. Near us was open water, but on every side was ice. Ice ten feet high was everywhere, and to the right and left and back and front were icebergs. Some of them were mountain high. This sea of ice was forty miles wide, they told me. We did not wait for the Carpathia to come to us. We rode to it. We were lifted up in a sort of nice little sling that was lowered to us. After that, it was all over. The passengers of the Carpathia were so afraid that we would not have enough room that they gave us practically the whole ship to ourselves. It had been learned that some of the passengers, in fact all of the women passengers of the Titanic who were rescued, refer to Lady Margaret, as they call Mrs. Brown, as the strength of them all. Transferring the Rescued Officers of the Carpathia report that when they reached the scene of the Titanic's wreck, there were 50 bodies or more floating in the sea. Only one mishap attended the transfer of the rescued from the lifeboats. One large collapsible lifeboat, in which 13 persons were seated, turned turtle just as they were about to save it, and all in it were lost. The Dog Hero not the least among the heroes of the Titanic disaster was Rigel, a big black Newfoundland dog belonging to the first officer who went down with the ship. But for Rigel, the fourth boat picked up might have been run down by the Carpathia. For three hours he swam in the icy water where the Titanic went down, evidently looking for his master, and was instrumental in guiding the boatload of survivors to the gangway of the Carpathia. Jonas Briggs, a seaman aboard the Carpathia, now has Rigel and told the story of the dog's heroism. The Carpathia was moving slowly about looking for boats, rafts, or anything which might be afloat. Exhausted with their efforts, weak from lack of food and exposure to the cutting wind and terror stricken, the men and women in the fourth boat had drifted under the Carpathia's starboard bow. They were dangerously close to the steamship, but too weak to shout a warning loud enough to reach the bridge. 
The boat might not have been seen were it not for the sharp barking of Rigel, who was swimming ahead of the craft, and valiantly announced his position. The barks attracted the attention of Captain Rostron, and he went to the starboard end of the bridge to see where they came from, and saw the boat. He immediately ordered the engine stopped, and the boat came alongside the starboard gangway. Care was taken to get Rigel aboard, but he appeared little affected by his long trip through the ice-cold water. He stood by the rail and barked until Captain Rostron called Briggs and had him take the dog below. A Thrilling Account of Rescue Mr. Wallace Bradford of San Francisco, a passenger aboard the Carpathia, gave the following thrilling account of the rescue of the Titanic's passengers. Since half past four this morning, I have experienced one of those never-to-be-forgotten circumstances that weighs heavy on my soul, and which shows most awfully what poor things we mortals are. Long before this reaches you, the news will be flashed that the Titanic has gone down, and that our steamer, the Carpathia, caught the wireless message when 75 miles away. And so far, we have picked up 20 boats estimated to contain about 750 people. None of us can tell just how many, as they have been hustled to various staterooms and to the dining saloons to be warmed up. I was awakened by unusual noises and imagined that I smelled smoke. I jumped up and looked out of my porthole and saw a huge iceberg looming up like a rock offshore. It was not white, and I was positive that it was a rock, and the thought flashed through my mind. How in the world can we be near a rock when we are four days out from New York in a southerly direction and in mid-ocean? When I got on deck, the first man I encountered told me that the Titanic had gone down and we were rescuing the passengers. The first two boats from the doomed vessel were in sight, making toward us. Neither of them was crowded. This was accounted for later by the fact that it was impossible to get many to leave the steamer, as they would not believe that she was going down. It was a glorious clear morning and a quiet sea. Off to the starboard was a white area of ice plain, from whose even surface rose mammoth forts, castles and pyramids of solid ice, almost as real as though they had been placed there by the hand of man. Our steamer was hove to about two and a half miles from the edge of this huge iceberg. The Titanic struck about 11.20 p.m. and did not go down until two o'clock. Many of the passengers were in evening dress when they came aboard our ship, and most of these were in a most bedraggled condition. Near me, as I write, is a girl about 18 years old in a fancy dress costume of bright colors, while in another seat nearby is a woman in a white dress trimmed with lace and covered with jaunty blue flowers. As the boats came alongside after the first two, all of them contained a very large proportion of women. In fact, one of the boats had women at the oars, one in particular containing, as near as I could estimate, about forty-five women and only about six men. In this boat, two women were handling one of the oars. All of the engineers went down with the steamer. Four bodies had been brought aboard. One is that of a fireman, who is said to have been shot by one of the officers because he refused to obey orders. Soon after I got on deck, I could, with the aid of my glasses, count seven boats headed our way, and they continued to come up to half past eight o'clock. Some were in sight for a long time and moved very slowly, showing plainly that the oars were being handled by amateurs or by women. No baggage of any kind was brought by the survivors. In fact, the only piece of baggage that reached the Carpathia is from the Titanic is a small closed trunk about 24 inches square, evidently the property of an Irish female immigrant. While some seemed fully dressed, many of the men having their overcoats and the women's sealskin and other coats, others came just as they had jumped from their berths, clothed in their pajamas and bathrobes. The Sorrow of the Living Of the survivors in general, it may be said that they escaped death and gained life. Life is probably sweet to them as it is to everyone, but what physical and mental torture has been the price of life to those who were brought back to land on the Carpathia, the hours in lifeboats amid the crashing of ice, the days of anguish that have succeeded, the horrors of body and mind still experienced and never to be entirely absent until death affords them its relief. The thought of the nation today is for the living, 
They need our sympathy, our consolation, more than do the dead. And, perhaps, in the majority of the cases, they need our protecting care as well. End of chapter 9「Ten of the Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic and Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 10. On Board the Carpathia. Aid for the Suffering and Hysterical. Burying the Dead. Vote of thanks to Captain Rostron of the Carpathia. Identifying those saved. Communicating with land. The passage to New York. If the scenes in the lifeboats were tear-bringing, hardly less so was the arrival of the boats at the Carpathia with their bands of terror-stricken, grief-ridden survivors, many of them too exhausted to know that safety was at hand. Watchers on the Carpathia were moved to tears. The first lifeboat reached the Carpathia about half past five o'clock in the morning, recorded one of the passengers on the Carpathia, and the last of the sixteen boats was unloaded before nine o'clock. Some of the lifeboats were only half filled, the first one having but two men and eleven women, when it had accommodations for at least forty. There were few men in the boats. The women were the gamest lot I had ever seen. Some of the men and women were in evening clothes, and others among those saved had nothing on but night clothes and raincoats. After the Carpathia had made certain that there was no more passengers of the Titanic to be picked up, she threaded her way out of the ice fields for fifty miles. It was dangerous work, but it was managed without trouble. Aid for the Suffering and Hysterical the shrieks and cries of the women and men picked up in the lifeboats by the Carpathia were horrible. The women were clothed only in night robes and wrappers. The men were in their night garments. One was lifted on board entirely nude. All the passengers who could bear nourishment were taken into the dining rooms and cabins by Captain Rostron and given food and stimulants. Passengers of the Carpathia gave up their berths and staterooms to the survivors. As soon as they were landed on the Carpathia, many of the women became hysterical, but on the whole, they behaved splendidly. Men and women appeared to be stunned all day Monday, the full force of the disaster not reaching them until Tuesday night. After being wrapped up in blankets and filled with brandy and hot coffee, the first thoughts were for their husbands and those at home. Most of them imagined that their husbands had been picked up by other vessels, and they began flooding the wireless rooms with messages. It was almost certain that those who were not on board the Carpathia had gone down to death. One of the most seriously injured was a woman who had lost both her children. Her limbs had been severely torn, but she was very patient. Women Seeking News in the first cabin library, women of wealth and refinement mingled their grief and asked eagerly for news of the possible arrival of a belated boat, or a message from other steamers telling the safety of their husbands. Mrs. Henry B. Harris, wife of a New York theatrical manager, checked her tears long enough to beg that some message of hope be sent to her father-in-law. Mrs. G. Thorne, Miss Marie Young, Mrs. Emil Tassig, and her daughter, Ruth, Mrs. Martin Rothschild, Mrs. William Augustus Spencer, Mrs. J. Stewart White, and Mrs. Walter M. Clark were a few of those who lay back, exhausted, on the leather cushions and told in shuddering sentences of their experiences. Mrs. John Jacob Astor and the Countess of Rhodes had been taken to staterooms soon after their arrival on shipboard. Before noon, at the captain's request, the first cabin passengers of the Titanic gathered in the saloon and the passengers of other classes and corresponding places on the rescue ship. Then the collecting of the names was begun by the purser and the stewards. A second table was served in both cabins for the new guests, and the Carpathia's second cabin, being better filled than its first, the second class arrivals had to be sent to steerage. Tears, their only relief. 
Mrs. Jacques Futrell, wife of the novelist, herself a writer of note, sat dry-eyed in the saloon, telling her friends that she had given up hope for her husband. She joined with the rest in inquiries as to the chances of rescue by another ship, and no one told her what soon came to be the fixed opinion of the men, that all those saved were on the Carpathia. "'I feel better,' Mrs. Futrell said hours afterward, "'for now I can cry.' Among the men conversation centered on the accident and the responsibility for it. Many expressed the belief that the Titanic, in common with other vessels, had had warning of the ice packs, but that in the effort to establish a record on the maiden run, sufficient heed had not been paid to the warnings. "'God knows I'm not proud to be here,' said a rich New York man. "'I got on a boat when they were about to lower it, and when, from delays below, there was no woman to take the vacant place. I don't think any man who was saved is deserving of censure, but I realize that, in contrast with those who went down, we may be viewed unfavorably. He showed a picture of his baby boy as he spoke. Pitiful Scenes of Grief As the day passed, the fore part of the ship assumed some degree of order and comfort, but the crowded second cabin and rear decks gave forth the incessant sound of lamentation. A bride of two months sat on the floor and moaned her widowhood. An Italian mother shrieked the name of her lost son. A girl of seven wept over the loss of her teddy bear and two dolls, while her mother, with streaming eyes, dared not tell the child that her father was lost too, and that the money for which their home in England had been sold had gone down with him. Other children clung to the necks of the fathers who, because carrying them, had been permitted to take the boats. In the hospital and public rooms lay, in blankets, several others who had been benumbed by the water. Mrs. Rosa Abbott, who was in the water for hours, was restored during the day. K. Whiteman, the Titanic's barber, who declared he was blown off the ship by the second of the two explosions after the crash, was treated for bruises. A passenger, who was thoroughly ducked before being picked up, caused much amusement on this ship, soon after the doctors were through with him, by demanding a bath. Survivors Aid the Destitute Storekeeper Prentice, the last man off the Titanic to reach this ship, was also soon over the effects of his long swim in the icy waters into which he leaped from the poop deck. The physicians of the Carpathia were praised as was Chief Steward Hughes, for work done in making the arrivals comfortable and averting serious illness. Monday night on the Carpathia was one of rest. The wailing and sobbing of the day were hushed as widows and orphans slept. Tuesday, save for the crowded condition of the ship, matters took somewhat their normal appearance. The second cabin dining room had been turned into a hospital to care for the injured and the first, second, and third class dining rooms were used for sleeping rooms at night for women, while the smoking rooms were set aside for men. All available space was used, some sleeping in chairs and some on the floor, while a few found rest in the bathrooms. Every cabin had been filled, and women and children were sleeping on the floors in the dining saloon, library, and smoking rooms. The passengers of the Carpathia had divided their clothes with the shipwrecked ones until they had at least kept warm. It is true that many women had to appear on deck in kimonos, and some in underclothes with a coat thrown over them, but their lives had been spared and they were not thought of dress. Some children in the second cabin were entirely without clothes, but the women had joined together with needles and thread they could pick up from passenger to passenger and had made warm clothes out of the blankets belonging to the Carpathia. Women befriended one another. The women aboard the Carpathia did what they could by word and act to relieve the sufferings of the rescued. Most of the survivors were in great need of clothing, and this the women of the Carpathia supplied to them as long as their surplus stock held out. J. A. Shuttleworth of Louisville, Kentucky, befriended Mrs. Lucian Smith, whose husband went down with the Titanic. Mrs. Smith was formerly Miss Eloise Hughes, daughter of Representative, and Mrs. James A. Hughes of Huntington, West Virginia, and was on her wedding trip. Mr. Shuttleworth asked her if there wasn't something he could do for her. She said that all the money she had was lost on the Titanic, 
so Mr. Shuttleworth gave her five hundred dollars. Deaths on the Carpathia Two of the rescued from the Titanic died from shock and exposure before they reached the Carpathia, and another died a few minutes after being taken on board. The dead were W. H. Hoyt, first cabin, Abraham Hormer, third class, and S. C. Sarbert, steward, and they were buried at sea the morning of April 15th, latitude 41.14 north, longitude 51.24 west. P. Lyon, able seaman, died and was buried at sea the following morning. An assistant steward lost his mind upon seeing one of the Titanic's rescued firemen expire after being lifted to the deck of the Carpathia. An Episcopal bishop and a Catholic priest from Montreal read services of their respective churches over the dead. The bodies were sewed up in sacks, heavily weighted at the feet, and taken to an opening in the side of the ship on the lower deck not far above the water line. A long plank tilted at one end served as the incline down which the weighted sacks slid into the sea. After we got the Titanic's passengers on board our ship, said one of the Carpathia's officers, it was a question as to where we should take them. Some said the Olympic would come out and meet us and take them on to New York, but others said they would die if they had to be lowered again into small boats to be taken up by another. So we finally turned toward New York, delaying the Carpathia's passengers eight days in reaching the Gibraltar. Survivors watch new boats. There were several children on board who had lost their parents. One baby of 11 months with a nurse who, coming on board the Carpathia with the first boat, watched with eagerness and sorrow for each incoming boat, but to no avail. The parents had gone down. There was a woman in the second cabin who lost seven children out of ten, and there were many other losses quite as horrible. Mr. Ismay, Pitiable Sight Among the rescued ones who came on board the Carpathia was the president of the White Star Line. Mr. Ismay reached the Carpathia in about the tenth lifeboat, said an officer. I didn't know who he was, but afterward heard the others of the crew discussing his desire to get something to eat the minute he put his foot on deck. The steward who waited on him, McGuire from London, says Mr. Ismay came dashing into the dining room and throwing himself into a chair said, Hurry for God's sake and get me something to eat. I'm starved. I don't care what it costs or what it is. Bring it to me. McGuire brought Mr. Ismay a load of stuff and when he had finished it, he handed McGuire a two-dollar bill. "'Your money is no good on this ship,' McGuire told him. "'Take it,' insisted Mr. Ismay, shoving the bill in McGuire's hand. "'I am well able to afford it. I will see to it that the boys of the Carpathia are well rewarded for this night's work.' This promise started McGuire making inquiries as to the identity of the man he had waited on. Then we learned he was Mr. Ismay. I did not see Mr. Ismay after the first few hours. He must have kept to his cabin. A passenger on the Carpathia said there was no wonder that none of the wireless telegrams addressed to Mr. Ismay were answered until the one that he sent yesterday afternoon to his line, the White Star. Mr. Ismay was beside himself, said this woman passenger, and on most of the voyage after we had picked him up, he was being quieted with opiates on orders of the ship's doctor. Five dogs and one pig saved. Five women saved their pet dogs, carrying them in their arms. Another woman saved a little pig, which she said was her mascot. Though her husband is an Englishman and she lives in England, she is an American and was on her way to visit her folks here. How she cared for the pig aboard ship, I do not know, but she carried it up the side of the ship in a big bag. I did not mind the dog so much. But it seemed to me to be too much when a pig was saved and human beings went to death. It was not until noon on Monday that we cleared the last of the ice, and Monday night a dense fog came up and continued until the following morning. Then a strong wind, a heavy sea, a thunderstorm, and a dense fog Tuesday night caused some of the uneasiness among the more unnerved, the fog continuing all of Tuesday. A number of whales were sighted as the Carpathia was clearing the last of the ice, one large one being close by, and all were spouting like geysers. 
VOTE OF THANKS TO THE CARPATHIA On Tuesday afternoon, a meeting of the uninjured survivors was called in the main saloon for the purpose of devising means of assisting the more unfortunate, many of whom had lost relatives and all their personal belongings, and thanking divine providence for their deliverance. The meeting was called to order, and Mr. Samuel Goldenberg was elected chairman. Resolutions were then passed, thanking the officers, surgeons, passengers, and crew of the Carpathia for their splendid services in aiding the rescued, and like resolutions for the admirable work done by the officers, surgeons, and crew of the Titanic. A committee was then appointed to raise funds on board the Carpathia to relieve the immediate wants of the destitute and assist them in reaching their destinations, and also to present a loving cup to the officers of the Carpathia, and also a loving cup to the surviving officers of the Titanic. Mr. T. J. Frauenthal of New York was made chairman of the Committee of Subscriptions. A committee consisting of Mrs. J. J. Brown, Mrs. William Bucknell, and Mrs. George Stone was appointed to look after the destitute. There was a subscription taken up and up to Wednesday the amount contributed totaled fifteen thousand dollars the work of the crew on board the carpathia in rescuing the most noble and remarkable and these four days that the ship has been overcrowded with its seven hundred ten extra passengers could not have been better handled the stewards have worked with undying strength although one was overcome with so much work and died and was put to his grave at sea i have never seen or felt the benefits of such royal treatment I have heard the captain criticized because he did not answer telegrams, but all that I can say is that he showed us every possible courtesy, and if we had been on our own boats, having paid our fares there, we could not have had better food or better accommodations. Men who had paid for the best staterooms on the Carpathia left their rooms so that we might have them. They fixed up beds in the smoking rooms and mattresses everywhere. All the women who were rescued were given the best staterooms, which were surrendered by the regular passengers. None of the regular passengers grumbled because their trip to Europe was interrupted, nor did they complain that they were put to the inconvenience of receiving hundreds of strangers. The women on board the Carpathia were particularly kind. It shows that for every cruelty of nature there is a kindness, for every misfortune there is some goodness. The men and women took up collections on board for the rescued steerage passengers. Mrs. Astor, I believe, contributed $2,000, her check being cashed by the Carpathia. Altogether, something like $15,000 was collected, and all the women were provided with sufficient money to reach their destination after they were landed in New York. Under any other circumstances, the suffering would have been intolerable, but the Good Samaritans on the Carpathia gave many women heart's ease. The spectacle on board the Carpathia on the return trip to New York at times was heartrending, while at other times those on board were quite cheerful. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of The Sinking of the Titanic in Great Sea Disasters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. The Sinking of the Titanic in Great Sea Disasters. Edited by Logan Marshall. Chapter 11. Preparations on Land to Receive the Sufferers. Police Arrangements, Donations of Money and Supplies, Hospitals and Ambulances Made Ready, Private Houses Thrown Open, Waiting for the Carpathia to Arrive, The Ship Sighted. New York City, touched to the heart by the great ocean calamity and desiring to do what it could to lighten the woes and relieve the sufferings of the pitiful little band of men and women rescued from the Titanic, opened both its heart and its purse. The most careful and systematic plans were made for the reception and transfer to homes, hotels, or institutions of the Titanic survivors. Mayor Gaynor, with Police Commissioner Waldo, arranged to go down the bay on the police boat patrol to come up with the Carpathia and take charge of the police arrangements at the pier. 
in anticipation of the enormous number that would, for a variety of reasons, credible or otherwise, surge about the Cunard Pier at the coming of the Carpathia, Mayor Gaynor and the police commissioner had seen to it that the streets should be rigidly sentineled by continuous lines of policemen under Inspector George McCluskey, the man of most experience, perhaps, in handling large crowds. There were 200 men, including 12 mounted men and a number in citizens' clothes. For two blocks to the north, south, and east of the dock lines were established through which none save those bearing passes from the government and the Cunard line could penetrate. With all arrangements made that experience or information could suggest, the authorities settled down to await the docking of the Carpathia, no word had come to either the White Star Line or the Cunard Line, they said, that any of the Titanic's people had died on that ship, or that bodies had been recovered from the sea. But in the afternoon, Mayor Gaynor sent word to the Board of Coroners that it might be well for some of that body to meet the incoming ship. Coroners Feinberg and Holzhauser, with Coroner's Physician Weston, arranged to go down the bay on the patrol, while Coroner Hallenstein waited at the pier. An undertaker was notified to be ready if needed. Fortunately, there was no such need. Every Possible Measure Thought Of Every possible measure of relief for the survivors that could be thought of by officials of the city, of the federal government, by the heads of hospitals and the Red Cross and Relief Societies was arranged for. The Municipal Lodging House, which has accommodations for 700 persons, agreed to throw open its doors and furnish lodging and food to any of the survivors as long as they should need it. Commissioner of Charities Drummond did not know, of course, just how great the call would be for the services of his department. He went to the Cunard Pier to direct his part of the work in person. Meanwhile, he had 20 ambulances ready for instant movement on the city's pier at the foot of East 26th Street. They were ready to take patients of the reception hospital connected with Bellevue or the Metropolitan Hospital on Blackwell's Island. Ambulances from the Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn were also there to do their share. All the other hospitals in that city stood ready to take the Titanic's people and those that had ambulances promised to send them. The charity's ferry boat, Thomas S. Brennan, equipped as a hospital craft, lay off the department pier with nurses and physicians ready to be called to the Cunard Pier on the other side of the city. St. Vincent's Hospital had 120 beds ready, New York Hospital 12, Bellevue and the Reception Hospital 120, and Flower Hospital 12. The House of Shelter maintained by the Hebrew Sheltering and Immigrant Aid Society announced that it was able to care for at least 50 persons as long as might be necessary. The German Society of New York, the Irish Immigrant Society, the Italian Society, the Swedish Immigrant Society, and the Young Men's Christian Association were among the organizations that also offered to see that no needy survivor would go without shelter. Mrs. W. A. Bastide, whose husband is a member of the staff of St. Luke's Hospital, offered to the White Star Line the use of the newly opened ward at St. Luke's, which will accommodate from 30 to 60 persons. She said the hospital would send four ambulances with nurses and doctors and that she had collected clothing enough for 50 persons. The line accepted her offer and said that the hospital would be kept in form as to what was needed. A trustee of Bellevue also called at the White Star offices to offer ambulances. He said that five or six, with two or three doctors and nurses on each, would be sent to the pier if required. Many other hospitals, as well as individuals, called at the mayor's office, expressing willingness to take in anybody that should be sent to them. A woman living in 50th Street, just off 5th Avenue, wished to put her home at the disposal of the survivors. D. H. Knott, of 102 Waverly Place, told the mayor he could take care of 100 and give them both food and lodging at the Arlington, Holly and Earl Hotels. Commissioner Drummond visited the city hall and arranged with the mayor the plans for the relief to be extended directly by the city. 
Mr. Drummond said that the omnibuses would be provided to transfer passengers from the ship to the municipal lodging house. Mrs. Vanderbilt's Efforts Mrs. W. K. Vanderbilt, Jr. spent the day telephoning to her friends, asking them to let their automobiles be used to meet the Carpathia and take away those who needed surgical care. It was announced that as a result of Mrs. Van Vanderbilt's efforts, 100 limousine automobiles and all the Fifth Avenue and Riverside Drive automobile buses would be at the Cunard Pier. Immigration Commissioner Williams said that he would be at the pier when the Carpathia came in. There was to be no inspection of immigrants at Ellis Island. Instead, the commissioner sent seven or eight inspectors to the pier to do their work there, and he asked them to do it with the greatest possible speed and the least possible bother to the shipwrecked aliens. The immigrants who had no friends to meet them were to be provided for until their cases could be disposed of. Mr. Williams thought that some of them who had lost everything might have to be sent back to their homes. Those who were to be admitted to the United States were to be cared for by the Women's Relief Committee. Red Cross Relief Robert W. D. Forrest, chairman of the Red Cross Relief Committee of the Charity Organization Society, after conferring with Mayor Gaynor, said that in addition to an arrangement that all funds received by the mayor should be paid to Jacob H. Schiff, the New York Treasurer of the American Red Cross, the committee had decided that it could turn over all the immediate relief work to the Women's Relief Committee. The Red Cross Committee announced that careful plans had been made to provide for every possible emergency. The Emergency Committee received a telegram that Ernest P. Bicknell, director of the American Red Cross, was coming from Washington. The Red Cross Emergency Relief Committee was to have several representatives at the pier to look out for the passengers on the Carpathia. Mr. Persons and Dr. Devine were to be there, and it was planned to have others. The Salvation Army offered, through the mayor's office, accommodation for 30 single men at the industrial home, 533 West 48th Street, and for 20 others at its hotel, 18 Chatham Square. The Army's training school at 124 West 14th Street was ready to take 20 or 30 survivors. R. H. Farley, head of the White Star Line's third class department, said that the line would give all the steerage passengers railroad tickets to their destination. Mayor Gaynor estimated that more than 5,000 persons could be accommodated in quarters offered through his orders. Most of these offers, of course, would have to be rejected. The mayor also said that Colonel Conley of the 69th Regiment offered to turn out his regiment to police the pier but it was thought that such service would be unnecessary. Crowds at the docks Long before dark on Thursday night, a few people passed the police lines and with a yellow card were allowed to go on the dock. But reports had been published that the Carpathia would not be in till midnight, and by 8 o'clock there were not more than 200 people on the pier. In the next hour, the crowd with passes tripled in number. By nine o'clock, the pier held half as many as it could comfortably contain. The early crowd did not contain many women relatives of the survivors. Few nervous people could be seen, but here and there was a woman, usually supported by two male escorts, weeping softly to herself. On the whole, it was a frantic, grief-crazed crowd. Laborers rubbed shoulders with millionaires. The relatives of the rich had taxicabs waiting outside the docks. The relatives of the poor went there on foot in the rain, ready to take their loved ones. A special train was awaiting Mrs. Charles M. Hayes, widow of the president of the Grand Trunk Railroad. A private car also waited Mrs. George D. Widener. Early Arrivals at the Pier Among the first to arrive at the pier was a committee from the Stock Exchange, headed by R. H. Thomas and composed of Charles Knobloch, B. M. W. Baruch, Charles Holsderber, and J. Carlisle. Mr. Thomas carried a long black box which contained $5,000 in small bills which was to be handed out to the needy steerage survivors of the Titanic as they disembarked. 
With the early arrivals at the pier were the relatives of Frederick White, who was not reported among the survivors, though Mrs. White was, Harry Mock, who came to look for a brother and sister, and Vincent Astor, who arrived in a limousine with William A. Dobbin, Colonel Astor's secretary, and two doctors. The limousine was kept waiting outside to take Mrs. Astor to the Astor home on Fifth Avenue. Eight Limousine Cars the Waldorf Astoria had sent over eight limousine cars to convey to the hotel these survivors. Mrs. Mark Fortune and three daughters, Mrs. Lucien P. Smith, Mrs. J. Stewart White, Mrs. Thornton Davidson, Mrs. George C. Douglas, Mrs. George D. Widener and maid, Mrs. George Wick, Miss Bonnell, Miss E. Ryerson, Mrs. Susan P. Ryerson, Mrs. Arthur Ryerson, Miss Mary Wick, the Mrs. Howell, Mrs. John P. Snyder, and Mr. and Mrs. D. H. Bishop. 35 Ambulances at the Pier At one time, there were 35 ambulances drawn up outside the Cunard Pier. Every hospital in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and the Bronx was represented. Several of the ambulances came from as far north as the Lebanon Hospital in the Bronx and the Brooklyn Hospital in Brooklyn. Accompanying them were 70 interns and surgeons from the staff of hospitals and more than 125 male and female nurses. St. Vincent's sent the greatest number of ambulances, at one time, eight of them from this hospital being in line at the pier. Miss Eva Booth, direct head of the Salvation Army, was at the pier, accompanied by Miss Elizabeth Nye and a corps of her officers, ready to aid as much as possible. The Sheltering Society and various other similar organizations also were represented, all ready to take care of those who needed them. An officer of the 69th Regiment, NGNY, offered the White Star Line officials the use of the regiment's armory for any of the survivors. Mrs. Thomas Hughes, Mrs. August Belmont, and Monsieurs Lavelle and McMahon of St. Patrick's Cathedral, together with a score of black-robed Sisters of Charity, representing the Association of Catholic Churches, were on the pier long before the Carpathia was made fast, and worked industriously in aiding the injured and the ill. The Reverend Dr. William Carter, pastor of the Madison Avenue Reformed Church, was one of those at the pier with a private ambulance awaiting Miss Sylvia Caldwell, one of the survivors, who is known in church circles as a mission worker in foreign fields. Free Railroad Transportation The Pennsylvania Railroad sent representatives to the pier, who said that the railroad had a special train of nine cars in which it would carry free any passenger who wanted to go immediately to Philadelphia or points west. The Pennsylvania also had eight taxi cabs at the pier for conveyance of the rescue to the Pennsylvania Station in 33rd Street. Among those who later arrived at the pier before the Carpathia docked were P.A.B. Widener of Philadelphia, two women relatives of J.B. Thayer, William Harris, Jr., the theatrical man who was accompanied by Dr. Dinkinspill, and Henry Arthur Jones, the playwright. Relatives of Saved and Lost Commander Booth of the Salvation Army was there especially to meet Mrs. Elizabeth Nye and Mrs. Rogers Abbott, both Titanic survivors. Mrs. Abbott's two sons were supposed to be among the lost. Miss Booth had received a cablegram from London saying that other Salvation Army people were on the Titanic. She was eager to get news of them. Also on the pier was Major Blanton, USA, stationed at Washington, who was waiting for tidings of Major Butt, supposedly at the insistence of President Taft. Senator William A. Clark and Mrs. Clark were also in the company. Dr. John R. McKinty was waiting for Mr. and Mrs. Henry S. Harper. Ferdinand W. Roebling and Carl G. Roebling cousins of Washington A. Roebling, Jr., whose name is among the list of dead, went to the pier to see what they could learn of his fate. J. P. Morgan, Jr. arrived at the pier about half an hour before the Carpathia docked. He said he had many friends on the Titanic and was eagerly awaiting news of them all. 
Fire Commissioner Johnson was there with John Peel of Atlanta, Georgia, a brother of Mrs. Jacques Futrell. Mrs. Futrell has a son 12 years old in Atlanta and a daughter, Virginia, who has been in school in the North and is at present with friends in this city, ignorant of her father's death. A Man in Hysterics there was one man in that sad waiting company who startled those near him about nine o'clock by dancing across the pier and back. He seemed to be laughing, but when he was stopped, it was found that he was sobbing. He said that he had a relative on the Titanic and had lost control of his nerves. H. H. Brunt of Chicago was at the gangplank waiting for A. Salifield, head of the wholesale drug firm of Sparks, White & Company of London, who was coming to this country on the Titanic on a business trip and whose life was saved. Waiting for the Carpathia During the afternoon and evening tugboats, motorboats, and even sailing craft had been waiting off the Ambrose Light for the appearance of the Carpathia. Some of the waiting craft contained friends and anxious relatives of the survivors and those reported as missing. The sea was rough and choppy, and a strong east wind was blowing. There was a light fog, so that it was possible to see at a distance of only a few hundred yards. This lifted later in the evening. First to discover the incoming liner with her pitiful cargo was one of the tugboats. From out of the mist there loomed far out at the sea the incoming steamer. Rescue boat sighted. Liner ahead, cried the lookout on the tug to the captain. She must be the Carpathia, said the captain, and then he turned the nose of his boat toward the spot on the horizon. Then the huge black hull in one smokestack could be distinguished. It is the Carpathia, said the captain. I can tell her by the stack. The announcement sent a thrill through those who had heard it. Here, at the gate of New York, was a ship whose record for bravery and heroic work would be a familiar name in history. End of chapter 11
the cunarder had been as silent for days as though it too were a ship of the dead a list of survivors had been given out from its wireless station and that was all even the approximate time of its arrival had been kept a secret nearing port there was no response to the hail from one tug and as others closed in the steamship quickened her speed a little and left them behind as she swung up the channel there was an exploding of flashlights from some of the tugs answered seemingly by sharp stabs of lightning in the northwest that served to accentuate the silence and absence of light aboard the rescue ship five or six persons apparently members of the crew or the ship's officers were seen along the rail but otherwise the boat appeared to be deserted off quarantine the carpathia slowed down and hailing the immigration inspection boat asked if the health officer wished to board she was told that he did and came to a stop while dr o'connell and two assistants climbed on board again the newspaper men asked for some word of the catastrophe to the titanic but there was no answer and the carpathia continued toward her pier as she passed the revenue cutter mohawk and the derelict destroyer seneca anchored off tompkinsville the wireless on the government vessels was seen to flash but there was no answering spark from the carpathia entering the north river she laid her course close to the new jersey side in order to have room to swing into her pier by this time the rails were lined with men and women they were very silent there were a few requests for news from those on board and a few answers to questions shouted from the tugs the liner began to slacken her speed and the tugboat soon went alongside up above the inky blackness of the hull figures could be made out leaning over the port railing as though peering eagerly at the little craft which was bearing down on the carpathia some of them perhaps had passed through that inferno of the deep sea which sprang up to destroy the mightiest steamship afloat carpathia ahoy was shouted through a megaphone there was an interval of a few seconds and then ay ay came the reply is there any assistance that can be rendered was the next question thank you no was the answer in a tone that carried emotion with it meantime the tugboat was getting nearer and nearer to the carpathia and soon the faces of those leaning over the railing could be distinguished talk with survivors more faces appeared and still more a woman who called to a man on the tugboat was asked are you one of the titanic survivors yes said the voice hesitatingly do you need help uh, no after a pause if there is anything you want done it will be attended to thank you i have been informed that my relatives will meet me at the pier is it true that some of the lifeboats sank with the titanic yes there was some trouble in manning them they were not far enough away from her all of this questioning and receiving replies was carried on with the greatest difficulty the pounding of the liner's engines the washing of the sea the tugboat's engines made it hard to understand the woman's replies all cared for on board were the women properly cared for after the crash she was asked oh yes came the shrill reply the men were brave very brave here her voice broke and she turned and left the railing to reappear a few moments later and cry please report me as saved what name was asked she shouted a name that could not be understood and apparently believing that it had been turned away again and disappeared nearly all of us are very ill cried another woman here several other tugboats appeared and those standing at the railing were besieged with questions did the crash come on without warning a voice on one of the smaller boats megaphoned yes a woman answered most of us had retired we saved a few of our belongings how long did it take the boat to sink asked the voice titanic crew heroes not long came the reply the crew and the men were very brave oh it is dreadful dreadful to think of is mr john jacob astor on board no did he remain on the titanic after the collision i do not know 
Questions of this kind were showered at the few survivors who stood at the railing, but they seemed too confused to answer them intelligibly, and after replying evasively to some, they would disappear. Rushes on to dock. Are you going to anchor for the night? Captain Rostron was asked by megaphone as his boat approached Ambrose Light. It was then raining heavily. No, came the reply. I am going into port. There are sick people on board. We tried to learn when she would dock, said Dr. Walter Kennedy, head of the big ambulance corps on the mist-shrouded pier, and we were told it would not be before midnight, and that most probably it would not be before dawn tomorrow. The childish deception that has been practiced for days by the people who are responsible for the Titanic has been carried up to the very moment of the landing of the survivors. She proceeded past the Cunard Pier, where 2,000 persons were waiting her, and steamed to a spot opposite the White Star Piers at 21st Street. The ports and the big enclosed pier of the Cunard Line were opened, and through them the waiting hundreds, almost frantic with anxiety over what the Carpathia might reveal, watched her as with nerve-destroying leisure she swung about in the river, dropping over the lifeboats of the Titanic that they might be taken to the piers of the White Star Line. The Titanic Lifeboats it was dark in the river, but the lowering away of the lifeboats could be seen from the Carpathia's pier, and a deep sigh arose from the multitude there as they caught this first glance of anything associated with the Titanic. Then the Carpathia started for her own pier. As she approached it, the ports on the north side of Pier 54 were closed that the Carpathia might land there but through the two left open to accommodate the forward and after gang plates of the big liner the watchers could see her looming larger and larger in the darkness till finally she was directly alongside the pier as the boats were towed away the picture taking and shouting of questions began again john badnotch a buyer for macy and company called down to a representative of the firm that neither mr nor mrs isidore strauss were among the rescued on board the carpathia an officer of the Carpathia called down that 710 of the Titanic's passengers were on board, but refused to reply to other questions. The heavy hawsers were made fast without the customary shouting of ship's officers and pier hands. From the crowd on the pier came a long, shuddering murmur. In it were blended sighs and hundreds of whispers. The burden of it all was, here they come. Anxious Men and Women about each gangplank, a portable fence had been put in place, marking off some 50 feet of the pier, within which stood 100 or more customs officials. Next to the fence, crowded close against it, were anxious men and women, their gaze strained for a glance of the first from the ship, their mouths open to draw their breaths in spasmodic, quivering gasps, their bodies shaking with suppressed excitement, excitement which only the suspense itself was keeping in subjection. These were the husbands and wives, children, parents, sweethearts, and friends of those who had sailed upon the Titanic on its maiden voyage. They pressed to the head of the pier, marking the boats of the wrecked ship as they dangled at the side of the Carpathia, and were revealed in the sudden flashes of the photographers upon the tugs. They spoke in whispers, each group intent upon its own sad business. Newspaper writers, with pier passes showing in their hat bands, were everywhere. A sailor hurried outside the fence and disappeared, apparently on a mission for his company. There was a deep-drawn sigh as he walked away, shaking his head toward those who peered eagerly at him. Then came a man and woman of the Carpathia's own passengers, as their orderly dress showed them to be. Again, a sigh like a sob swept over the crowd, and again they turned back to the canopied gangplank. The First Survivors Several minutes passed, and then, out of the first cabin gangway, tunneled by a somber awning, streamed the first survivors. A young woman, hatless, her light brown hair disordered, and the laden weight of the crushing sorrow heavy upon eyes and sensitive mouth, was in the van. She stopped, perplexed, almost ready to drop with terror and exhaustion, and was caught by a customs official. A survivor? he questioned rapidly, and a nod of the head answering him, he demanded, Your name. The answer given, he started to lead her toward that section of the pier where her friends would be waiting. When she stepped from the gangplank, there was quiet on the pier. 
the answers of the woman could almost be heard by those fifty feet away but as she staggered rather than walked toward the waiting throng outside the fence a low wailing sound arose from the crowd dorothy dorothy cried a man from the number he broke through the double line of customs inspectors as though it was composed of wooden toys and caught the woman to his breast she opened her lips inarticulately weakly raised her arms and would have pitched forward upon her face had she not been supported her fair head fell weakly to one side as the man picked her up in his arms and with tears streaming down his face stalked down the long avenue of the pier and down the long stairway to a waiting taxicab the wailing of the crowd its cadences wild and weird grew steadily louder and louder till they culminated in a mighty shriek which swept the whole big pier as though at the direction of some master hand rumors afloat the arrival of the carpathia was the signal for the most sensational rumors to circulate through the crowd on the pier first mrs john jacob astor was reported to have died at eight o six o'clock when the carpathia was on her way up the harbor captain smith and the first engineer were reported to have shot themselves when they found that the titanic was doomed to sink afterward it was learned that captain smith and the engineer went down with their ship in perfect courage and coolness major archibald butt president taft's military aid was said to have entered into an agreement with george d widener colonel john jacob astor and isidore strauss to kill them first and then shoot himself before the boat sank it was said that this agreement had been carried out later it was shown that like many other men on the ship they had gone down without the exhibition of a sign of fear mrs cornell safe magistrate cornell's wife and her two sisters were among the first to leave the ship they were met at the first cabin pier entrance by magistrate cornell and a party of friends none of the three women had hats one of those who met them was magistrate cornell's son one of Mrs. Cornell's sisters was overheard to remark that it would be a dreadful thing when the ship began really to unload. The three women appeared to be in a very nervous state. Their hair was more or less disheveled. They were apparently fully dressed, save for their hats. Clothing had been supplied them in their need, and everything had been done to make them comfortable. One of the party said that the collision occurred at 9.45. Following closely the Cornell party was H. J. Allison of Montreal, who came to meet his family. One of the party, who was weeping bitterly as he left the pier, explained that the only one of the family that was rescued was the young brother. Mrs. Astor appeared. In a few minutes, young Mrs. Astor, with her maid, appeared. She came down the gangplank, unassisted. She was wearing a white sweater. Vincent Astor and William Dobbin, Colonel Astor's secretary, greeted her and hurried her to a waiting limousine which contained clothing and other necessities of which it was thought she might be in need. The young woman was white-faced and silent. Nobody cared to intrude upon her thoughts. Her stepson said little to her. He did not feel like questioning her at such a time, he said. Last Scene of Colonel Astor Walter M. Clark, a nephew of the senator, said that he had seen Colonel Astor put his wife in a boat after assuring her that he would soon follow her in another. Mr. Clark and others said that Colonel and Mrs. Astor were in their suite when the crash came and that they appeared quietly on deck a few minutes afterward. Here and there among the passengers of the Carpathia and from the survivors of the Titanic, the story was gleaned of the rescue nothing in life will ever approach the joy felt by the hundreds who were waiting in little boats on the spot where the titanic floundered when the lights of the carpathia were first distinguished that was at four o'clock on monday morning dr fraunthal welcomed efforts were made to learn from dr henry fraunthal something about the details of how he was rescued just then or as he was leaving the pier beaming with evident delight he was surrounded by a big crowd of his friends there's harry there he is they yelled and made a rush for him all the doctor's face that wasn't covered with red beard was aglow with smiles as his friends hugged him and slapped him on the back 
they rushed him off bodily through the crowd, and he, too, was whirled home. A SAD STORY How others followed, how heart-rending stories of partings and of thrilling rescues were poured out in an amazing stream, this has all been told over and over again in the news that for days amazed, saddened, and angered the entire world. It is the story of a disaster that nations, it is hoped, will make impossible in the years to come. In the stream of survivors were a peer of the realm, Sir Cosmo Duff Gordon and his secretary, side by side with plain Jack Jones of Birmingham, able seamen, millionaires and paupers, women with bags of jewels and others with nightgowns their only property. More than 70 Widows More than 70 widows were in the weeping company. The only large family that was saved in its entirety was that of the Carters of Philadelphia. Contrasting with this remarkable salvage of wealthy Pennsylvanians was the sleeping 11-month-old baby of the Allisons, whose father, mother, and sister went down to death after it, and its nurse had been placed in a lifeboat. Millionaire and pauper, titled grandee and weeping immigrant, Ismay, the head of the White Star Company, and Jack Jones from the Stoke Hole were surrounded instantly. Some would gladly have escaped observation. Every man among the survivors acted as though it were first necessary to explain how he came to be in a lifeboat. Some of the stories smacked of Minkowson. Others were as plain and unvarnished as a pike staff. Those that were the most sincere and trustworthy had to be fairly pulled from those who gave their sad testimony. Far into the night, the recitals were made. They were told in the rooms of hotels, in the wards of hospitals, and upon trains that sped toward saddened homes. It was a symposium of horror and heroism, the like of which has not been known in the civilized world since man established his dominion over the sea. Steerage Passengers The two hundred and more steerage passengers did not leave the ship until eleven o'clock. They were in a sad condition. The women were without wraps and the few men there were wore very little clothing. A poor Syrian woman, who said she was Mrs. Habush, bound for Youngstown, Ohio, carried in her arms a six-year-old baby girl. This woman had lost her husband and three brothers. I lost four of my men folks, she cried. Two Little Boys among the survivors who elicited a large measure of sympathy were two little French boys who were dropped, almost naked, from the deck of the sinking Titanic into a lifeboat. From what place in France did they come, and to what place in the New World were they bound? There was not one iota of information to be had as the identity of the waifs of the deep, the orphans of the Titanic. The two baby boys, two and four years old respectively, were in charge of Miss Margaret Hayes, who is a fluent speaker of French, and she had tried vainly to get from the lisping lips of the two little ones some information that would lead to the finding of their relatives. Miss Hayes, also a survivor of the Titanic, took charge of the almost naked waifs on the Carpathia. She became warmly attached to the two boys, who unconcernedly played about, not understanding the great tragedy that had come into their lives. The two little curly heads did not understand it at all. Had not their pretty 19-year-old foster mother provided them with pretty suits and little white shoes and playthings aplenty? Then, too, Miss Hayes had a palm dog that she brought with her from Paris, and which she carried in her arms when she left the Titanic, and held to her bosom throughout the long night in the lifeboat, and to which the children became warmly attached. All three became aliens on an alien shore. Miss Hayes, unable to learn the names of the little fellows, had dubbed the older Lewis and the younger Lump. Lump was all that his name implies, for he weighed almost as much as his brother. They were dark-eyed and brown, curly-haired children who knew how to smile as only French children can. On the fateful night of the Titanic disaster, and just as the last boats were pulling away with their human freight, a man rushed to the rail holding the babes under his arms. He cried to the passengers in one of the boats and held the children aloft. Three or four sailors and passengers held up their arms. The father dropped the older boy. He was safely caught. 
Then he dropped the little fellow and saw him folded in the arms of a sailor. Then the boat pulled away. The last scene of the father, whose last living act was to save his babes, he was waving his hand in a final parting. Then the Titanic plunged to the ocean's bed. Baby Travers Still more pitiable in one way was the lot of the baby survivor, eleven months old, Travers Allison, the only member of a family of four to survive the wreck. His father, H. J. Allison, and mother, and Lorraine, a child of three, were victims of the catastrophe. Baby Travers, in the excitement following the crash, was separated from the rest of the family just before the Titanic went down. With the party were two nurses and a maid. Major Arthur Puchin of Montreal, one of the survivors, standing near the little fellow, who, swathed in blankets, lay blinking at his nurse, described the death of Mrs. Allison. She had gone to the deck without her husband, and frantically seeking him, was directed by an officer to the other side of the ship. She failed to find Mr. Allison, and was quickly hustled into one of the collapsible lifeboats, and when last seen by Major Puchin, she was toppling out of the half-swamped boat. J. W. Allison, a cousin of H. J. Allison, was at the pier to care for baby Travers and his nurse. They were taken to the Manhattan Hotel. Describing the details of the perishing of the Allison family, the rescued nurse said they were all in bed when the Titanic hit the berg. We did not get up immediately, said she, for we had not thought of any danger. Later, we were told to get up, and I hurriedly dressed the baby. We hastened up on deck, and confusion was all about. With other women and children, we clambered to the lifeboats, just as a matter of precaution, believing there was no immediate danger. In about an hour, there was an explosion, and the ship appeared to fall apart. We were in the lifeboat about six hours before we were picked up. The Ryerson Family Probably few deaths have caused more tears than Arthur Ryerson's, in view of the sad circumstances which called him home from a lengthy tour in Europe. Mr. Ryerson's eldest son, Arthur Leonard Ryerson, a Yale student, was killed in an automobile accident Easter Monday, 1912. A cablegram announcing the death plunged the Ryerson family into mourning, and they boarded the first steamship for this country. It happened to be the Titanic and the death note came near being the cause of the blotting out of the entire family. The children who accompanied them were Miss Susan P. Ryerson, Miss Emily B. Ryerson, and John Ryerson. The latter is now 12 years old. They did not know their son intended to spend the Easter holidays at their home in Harverford, Pennsylvania, until they were informed of his death. John Lewis Hoffman, also of Haverford and a student of Yale, was killed with young Ryerson. The two were hurrying to Pennsylvania to escort a fellow student to his train. In turning out of the road to pass a cart, the motor car crashed into a pole in front of the entrance to the estate of Mrs. B. Frank Clyde. The college men were picked up unconscious and died in the Bryn Mawr Hospital. G. Hyde Norris of Philadelphia, who went to New York to meet the surviving members of the Ryerson family, told of a happy incident at the last moment as the Carpathia swung close to the pier. There had been no positive information that young Jack Ryerson was among those saved. Indeed, it was feared that he had gone down with the Titanic like his father, Arthur Ryerson. Mr. Norris spoke of the feeling of relief that came over him as, watching from the pier, he saw Jack Ryerson come from a cabin and stand at the railing. The name of the boy was missing from some of the lists, and for two days it was reported he had perished. Captain Rostron's Report Less than 24 hours after the Cunard Line steamship Carpathia came in as a rescue ship with survivors of the Titanic disaster, she sailed again for the Mediterranean cruise which she had originally started upon last week. Just before the liner sailed, H.S. Bride, the second Marconi wireless operator of the Titanic, who had both of his legs crushed on a lifeboat, was carried off on the shoulders of the steamship's officers to St. Vincent's Hospital. Captain A. H. Rostron of the Carpathia addressed an official report giving his account of the Carpathia's rescue work to the general manager of the Cunard Line, Liverpool. The report read, 
I beg to report that at 12.35 a.m. Monday, I was informed of urgent message from Titanic with her position. I immediately ordered ship turned around and put her in course for that position, we being then 58 miles south, 52 east from her. All heads of all departments called and issued what I considered the necessary orders to be in preparation for any emergency. At 2.40 a.m., saw flare half a point on port bow, taking this for granted to be ship shortly after we sighted our first iceberg. I had previously had lookouts doubled, knowing that the Titanic had struck ice, and so took every care and precaution. We soon found ourselves in a field of bergs, and had to alter course several times to clear the bergs weather fine and clear light air on sea beautifully clear night though dark we stopped at four a m thus doing distance in three hours and a half picking up the first boat at four ten a m boat in charge of officer and he had reported that titanic had foundered at eight thirty a m last boat picked up all survivors aboard and all boats accounted for fifteen lifeboats one boat abandoned two burthen boats alongside saw one floating upwards among wreckage and according to second officer senior officer saved one berth on boat had not been launched it having got jammed making sixteen lifeboats and four berth on boats accounted for by the time we had cleared first boat it was breaking day and i could see all within area of four miles we also saw that we were surrounded by icebergs large and small huge field of drift ice with large and small bergs in it the ice field trending from northwest round west to south to southeast as far as we could see either way at eight a m the leyland s s california came up i gave him the principal news and asked him to search and i would proceed to new york at eight fifty proceeded full speed while researching over vicinity of disaster and while we were getting people aboard i gave orders to get spare hands along and swing in all our boats disconnect the fall and hoist up as many titanic boats as possible in our davits also get some on forecastle heads by derricks we got thirteen lifeboats six on forward deck and seven in davits after getting all survivors aboard and while searching i got a clergyman to offer a short prayer of thankfulness for those saved and also a short burial service for their loss in saloon before deciding definitely where to make for, I conferred with Mr. Ismay, and as he told me to do what I thought best, I informed him I considered New York best. I knew we should require clean blankets, provisions, and clean linen, even if we went to the Azores, as most of the passengers saved were women and children, and they hysterical, not knowing what medical attention they might require. I thought it best to go to New York. I also thought it would be better for Mr. Ismay to go to New York or England as soon as possible, and knowing I should be out of wireless communication very soon if I proceeded to Azores. It left Halifax, Boston, and New York, so I chose the latter. Again, the passengers were all hysterical about ice, and I pointed out to Mr. Ismay the possibilities of seeing ice if I went to Halifax. Then I knew it would be best to keep in touch with land stations as best I could. We have experienced great difficulty in transmitting news, also names of survivors. Our wireless is very poor, and again we have had so many interruptions from other ships, and also messages from shore, principally press, which we ignored. I gave instructions to send first all official messages, then names of passengers, then survivors' private messages. We had haze early Tuesday morning for several hours again more or less all wednesday from five thirty a m to five p m strong south southwesterly winds and clear weather thursday with moderate rough sea i am pleased to say that all survivors have been very plucky the majority of women first second and third class lost their husbands and considering all have been wonderfully well tuesday our doctor reported all survivors physically well our first-class passengers have behaved splendidly, given up their cabins voluntarily, and supplied the ladies with clothes, etc. We all turned out of our cabins and gave them to survivors, saloon, smoking room, library, etc., also being used for sleeping accommodation. Our crew also turned out to let the crew of the Titanic take their quarters. 
I am pleased to state that owing to preparations made for the comfort of survivors, none were the worse for exposure, etc. I beg to specially mention how willing and cheerful the whole of the ship's company behaved, receiving the very highest praise from everybody. And I can assure you, I am very proud to have such a company under my command. A. H. Rostron. End of Part 1 of Chapter 12chapter 12 part 2 of the sinking of the titanic in great sea disasters this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org this reading by allison hester of athens georgia the sinking of the titanic in great sea disasters edited by logan marshall chapter 12 part 2 the following list of the survivors and dead contains the latest revisions and corrections of the White Star Line officials and was furnished by them exclusively for this book. List of Survivors First Cabin Anderson, Harry Antoinette, Miss Apiranelt, Miss Appleton, Mrs. E. D. Abbott, Mrs. Rose Allison, Master and Nurse Andrews, Miss Cornelia I. Allen, Miss E. W. Astor, Mrs. John Jacob and Maid. Albert, Monsieurs N. and Maid. Barrett, Carl B. Beset, Miss. Barkworth, A. H. Bucknell, Mrs. W. Bowerman, Miss E. Brown, Mrs. J. J. Burns, Miss C. M. Bishop, Mr. and Mrs. D. H. Blank, H. Bessina, Miss A. Baxter, Mrs. James. Brayton, George. Bonnell, Miss Lily. Brown, Mrs. J. M. Bowen, Miss G. C. Beckwith, Mr. and Mrs. R. L. Bisley, Mr. and Mrs. Bonnell, Miss C. Casabir, Mrs. H. A. Cardeza, Mrs. J. W. Candell, Mrs. Churchill. Case, Howard B. Camerion, Kennard. Casaboro, Miss D. D. Clark, Mrs. W. M. Chibinus, Mrs. B. C. Charlton, W. M. Crosby, Mrs. E. G. Carter, Mrs. Lucille. Calderhead, E. P. Chandanson, Miss Victoria. Cavendish, Mrs. Terrell and Maid. Chaffee, Mrs. H. I. Cardeza, Mr. Thomas. Cummings, Mrs. J. Chevry, Paul. Cherry, Miss Gladys. Chambers, Mr. and Mrs. N. C. Carter, Mr. and Mrs. W. E. Carter, Master William. Compton, Mrs. A. T. Compton, Miss S. R. Crosby, Mrs. E. G. Crosby, Miss Harriet. Cornell, Mrs. R. C. Chibnall, Mrs. E. Douglas, Mrs. Fred. De Villiers, Monsieur. Daniel, Miss Sarah. Daniel, Robert W. Davidson, Mr. and Mrs. Thornton and family. Douglas, Mrs. Walter and maid. Dodge, Miss Sarah. Dodge, Mrs. Washington and son. Dick, Mr. and Mrs. A. A. Danielle, H. Heron. Drotsinstead, A. Daly, Peter D. Andres, Miss Caroline. Ellis, Miss. Earnshaw, Mrs. Bolton. Eustace, Miss E. Emmock, Philip E. Flagenheim, Mrs. Antoinette. Frenicatelli, Mizey. Finn, J. I. Fortune, 
Miss Alice. Fortune, Miss Ethel. Fortune, Mrs. Mark. Fortune, Miss Mabel. Frauenthal, Dr. and Mrs. H. W. Frauenthal, Mr. and Mrs. T. G. Frolicher, Miss Margaret. Frolicher, May and Mrs. Frolicher, Miss N. Futrell, Mrs. Jocks. Gracie, Colonel Archibald. Graham, Mr. and Mrs. William. Graham, Miss M. Gordon, Sir Cosmo Duff. Gordon, Lady. Gibson, Miss Dorothy. Goldenberg, Mr. and Mrs. Samuel. Goldenberg, Miss Ella. Greenfield, Mrs. L.P. Greenfield, G.B. Greenfield, William. Gibson, Mrs. Leonard. Gooch, James. Haven, Mr. Henry B. Harris, Mrs. H.B. Holverson, Mrs. Alex. Hodgeboom, Mrs. J.C. Hawksford, W.J. Harper, Henry and Manservant. Harper, Mrs. H.S. Hold, Miss J.A. Hope, Nina. Hoyt, Mr. and Mrs. Fred.